in in three, two, one. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served in education in Baltimore County. Um, Mr. Mahumsa, would you lead us in the pledge? Yes, good evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Mahumza. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting a discussion, or, or as well as when requ requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the January 19th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additional changes to tonight's agenda? Yes. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Based on the board's motion at the January 12th, 2021 work session, I request moving item K1, the second work session of the proposed FY22 operating budget to a special work session to be held on January 26, 2021. In addition, uh, materials will be provided to the board uh, this Friday, um, and we are planning to review and fill questions related to Appendix A, schools, and Appendix B, uh, business services. In addition, in preparation for a third work session on February 9th, materials will be sent to the board in advance, and a fourth budget session may be scheduled on Tuesday, February 16th, if needed to clarify questions and the board can vote on the proposed FY22 operating budget on Tuesday, F uh, Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. Okay, um, thank you for that, Dr. Williams. In accordance with board policy 8314, a majority vote of the board is required to add or remove an item from the agenda. So may I have a motion to move agenda item K, second work session, of the proposed fiscal year 2022 operating budget to a special work session of the board to be held on January 26, 2021. So, so moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second row. Second. Kim. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All right, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call? Ms. Causey. Oh, I apologize. Yes, Ms. Causey. Uh, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. If the board is going to have a special work session on January 26th and there was an opportunity to um, also hear uh, uh, 
other updates? Um, is that an opportunity uh, for the board to add additional agenda items? Dr. Williams, that would be a question for you. So my request was to make January 26 a operating board work session on the budget. Um, so I'm sure any questions that were emailed in or sent in um, could be answered at that time. Correct. Okay. Correct. Related to the budget. Absolutely. Yes. Related to the budget. Yes. OK. All right. Are there any other questions or any other discussion? All right. Hearing none. Ms. Govert, may I have a roll call vote, please? Can I get clarification of who made that motion? There were several. Me. Can I get clarification on the motion? Mr. Offerman. OK. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Would you like the me motion? to reread the motion? Yes, yes please. please. Thank you. The motion is to move agenda item K, second work session of the proposed FY22 operating budget to a special work session of the board to be held on January 26, 2021. OK, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Millian? Mr. McMillian? Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Thank you. So the motion carries. Madam, Madam Chair, Chair. I, this is Ms. Causey. Can I just ask for clarification of the additional work sessions that Dr. Williams referenced? Um, Ms. Causey, Dr. Williams, is that something that could be emailed um, to the board so they could have clarification on that? Um, and 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 particulars is that something that we could get um, via email and if anybody had any questions that they could email to you for additional information yes thank you madam chair i do have one more item yes dr williams so in light of the january 15th 2021 letter from the county attorney in the interconnected nature of these agreements I'm asking that all the contracts be removed from tonight's agenda until the county attorney has had the opportunity to review the matter. We will bring the contracts back to the board at a future meeting. Okay, may I have a motion to remove agenda item G, new business contract awards from the agenda? So moved, Ro. Is there a second? Second Offerman. Thank you. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Thank you. I believe that's Mr. Kuhn. Oh, okay, thank you for that. Okay, and the... Okay, so the motion passes. 
All right, um, thank you for that. And the revised agenda is approved. All right, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of employees or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Eight, consult with staff, consultants, or with or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Nine, conduct collective um, bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations and 15 discuss cybersecurity. If the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to one security assessments or deployments relating to information, resources, technology two network security information or three deployments or implementation of security personnel, critical infrastructure or security devices. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Thank you. Okay, and the next item on the agenda is personal matters and for that I call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters resignations, retirements. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personal matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D2? Excuse me, Madam Chair, could I ask you to divide those agenda items, please? Okay, so we're dividing um, D1 and D2. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve personal matters as presented in exhibits D1? So moved, Mac. Do I have a second? Second, Hofferman. Okay, any discussion? Okay, Miss, hearing no discussion, may I have a roll call vote on exhibit D1? Ms. Rowe? Abstain. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, do I have a motion to approve um, personal matters as presented in Exhibit D2? So moved, Kuhn. Do I have a second? Second, Molly. Thank you. Any discussion on exhibit D2? Okay, hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Abstain. Ms. Cosby? I'm recusing myself. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor seven. Thank you, the motion carries. <coughs> the next item on the agenda is public comment. 
the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. The board is currently accepting written public comments. The board discourages comments on specific student or employee matters, comments on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County, and any inappropriate personal remarks. The school system is committed to accessible communication with its stakeholders. Comments from stakeholder groups and other members of the public may be emailed to boe at, at my, my, bcps info. The board reserves the right to disseminate public comments through board docs as long as one submitter specific, specifically requests their comments to be published as part of the public record. Two, the comments adhere to the board's stated guideline, guidelines. Three, the comments include the name of the submitter. And four, the comments have been received before 1150 p.m. on the Monday before the board meeting. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening, Madam Chair. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session to deliberate on a confidential student matter in case number HE21-04. Now would be an appropriate time to convert, confirm the vote taken in closed session. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session and approve Ms. Gover to sign the order on behalf of the board? So, so moved, Mac. Second. Thank you. you. Is there a second? I'm sorry, I think I was speaking over. Um, who made the second? Second, second Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Recuse. Ms. Clasey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Abstain. <clears throat> Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Okay, so it's just looking. So um, I just wanted to check item G has been removed. Um, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so now we will be going to um, H, which is the the discussion of the reopening of schools. So the next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. What's that? I have a flat tire. So, so good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the Board of Education. We are here to provide an update and we have our health officer for Baltimore County, Dr. Gregory Branch. I thought you had left a while ago. I did. Mr. Brusades, oh, please. Oh, goodness, mute if we yourself. can make sure everybody is muted, please. <laughs> Dr. Thank Branch, you. can you hear me? I'm sorry, if we can make sure everyone is muted because we're hearing conversation while Dr. Williams is speaking. <laughs> so, okay. what I'm saying, we are here to provide an update, and we have our health officer for Baltimore County, that is. Dr. Gregory uh, Branch. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Branch. Dr. Branch and his team continue to partner with our leadership to examine trends, share inform information, and provide guidance on health-related decision-making. So Dr. Branch is here to speak to the board, and I would like to turn it over to Dr. Branch. Dr. Branch? This is Dr. Branch. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, you Dr. Branch. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. First, I'd like to thank the school board for allowing me to be with you on this evening. 
Second, I count it an honor and a privilege to work with Dr. Williams and his cabinet. And thirdly, I would like to extend to each and every one of you a virtual handshake and a fist bump. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in unprecedented times, and I would like to take this opportunity to remember the countless number of Baltimore County residents that have lost their lives to this unrelenting disease called COVID-19. As a COVID overview, the COVID virus is a novel virus, which means it's a new virus that no one has been exposed to. The COVID virus is here, it's ever-changing, and it's potentially deadly. As noted in the surveillance reports from MDH this morning, we have two cases in Maryland of the new strain of COVID virus that was from England. The state has not seen any other variants yet, including the Brazilian variant. And I say yet. I say yet because it's probably coming. As of yesterday, Baltimore County had 44,207 confirmed cases of COVID, and unfortunately, 1,033 confirmed deaths. Baltimore County's positivity rate is 5.9% today, and our cases per 100,000 is 32.6. The established targets per NSDE are 5 and 15% respectively, for reopening of the schools. So what is the role of the health department in this pandemic? Health and Human Services is simultaneously running five massive logistic operations. We're running hotlines, contact tracing programs, outbreak investigation programs, testing, and a mass vaccination program. These major pro uh, projects require significant staffing and infrastructure. Right now, we are pulling staff from all departments in county government to support this work. The vaccine is about 95% uh, percent protective against severe or symptomatic COVID, but we're not yet sure that the vaccine will completely stop the very mild cases of COVID. So even though we have the vaccine, everyone should con continue wearing their masks until the CDC determines that it's safe to stop. Now on vaccines generally, as of Friday, January 15th, more people received on vaccines in Baltimore County than any other local jurisdiction. Health and Human Services alone has distributed over 11,000 vaccines. And we anticipate distributing 8,000 more vaccines at clinics that are happening this week. Nationwide, vaccine is limited. And that holds true for the state of Maryland and Baltimore County. We do not know how much vaccine the state will allocate to us week to week. So I cannot predict when we're going to get everyone vaccinated. This problem is not unique to Baltimore County. There are stories from around the country of several local governments shutting down their vaccine clinics because they don't have enough vaccine to distribute. For the foreseeable future, demand is going to be higher than, some, than supply as it relates to the vaccine. Therefore, until we have ample supply of vaccine, we will not be able to vaccinate everyone in phase B, 1B, let alone phase 1C. So on the role of Health and Human Services in vaccinating our teachers and our educators, let me just say this. The ultimate plan, when there is ample supply of vaccine, so I'm going to repeat that. The ultimate plan, when there is ample supply of vaccine, is for the Baltimore County Public School System to be able to vaccinate their, their staff themselves. I've requested that the school system provide me with the clinical and non-clinical staff to begin shadowing the health department staff at our clinics. This will prepare 
public schools for, um, for running its independent clinic when we have a um, vaccine available. If the Baltimore County Public School is not capable of running an independent clinic for its staff, then I would not be able to consider Baltimore County for priority vaccine. So I requested a plan from the school system that includes the prioritizing of staff for vaccinations and the number of individuals in each group. This will allow me to determine how many vaccines I should be requesting from the state each week. We are vaccinating um, our first round of educators this week, but knowing the numbers in each priority group will allow um, us to better plan for the projected need. So the role of the local health department in Baltimore County in the schools and opening plan. The Baltimore County Public School staff used the CDC, MSDE, and MDH guidelines in developing its reopening plan. These metrics were not set by the local health department. It's not the local health department's responsibility to develop the school's reopening plan. It is, however, our responsibility to ensure that the plan meets the CDC, MDH, and MSDE guidelines. My health department has a metrics team that tracks our local COVID data, but unfortunately, I do not have the capacity to track global trends and best tra practices. As I mentioned to you, we're already inundated with the hotline outbreak investigations, contact tracing, testing, and now mass vaccinations. So as we have increased our pandemic work, it's become distinctly clear that the local health department does not have the bandwidth to provide the degree of assistance that you may need to advise on reopening plans. So if the Baltimore County Public School needs healthcare expertise regarding the reopening plan, experts outside the local health department should probably be tapped. And I know that the county executive has offered assistance from public health experts and will move towards the retaining public health experts from Johns Hopkins. These experts will be able to advise on some of the questions I know that you have about reopening. For example, do students have to wear masks all day? Can they have mask breaks? Do we need plexiglass barriers? Um, will you still need to limit the number of students in the room once they are vaccinated? The safety of youth sports participation, metrics for reopening, appropriate use of rapid testing in a school setting. Those are the questions that I'm quite sure that those experienced experts from Johns Hopkins can answer. So I fully um, support the county exec's decision to do this. So in closing, my top priority is scaling up the vaccination program so we can get needles into arms as we receive the vaccine. And that's what will ultimately make the difference in our final push against the virus and our collective effort to get our children back into the classroom. So I value the partnership with Dr. Williams and his team and I look forward to the continued work with the school board. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Branch. Um, there may be a few questions, but I wanna just wrap up this presentation and we really thank you for your time and thank you for your partnership. Um, if you can go to, I believe slide four, please. Yes, thank you. So as we work towards our re-entry, we continue to work through a timeline that will allow and promote a smooth transition for staff and students when they return in a hybrid model. As requested by the board at our last meeting, the information on this screen outlines the critical work that will be done prior to return. Currently this month, we are actively working on developing and implementing professional learning for our administrators, teachers, and support personnel. This professional learning will support building the capacity of our school-based staff in areas of school operations, health and safety measures, as well as teaching and learning. This will take place beginning January 21st and will continue on January 28th. Additionally, we will analyze and share the data
from our most recent questionnaire. This will allow our schools and central office to prepare. As you are aware, our MSDE approved reopening plan indicates small groups of students will return in a hybrid model. We are anticipating upcoming changes to the metrics and information from MSDE and the Maryland Department of Health that may require us to bring back small groups of students. When we know we are three weeks away from re-entry central office and schools will begin to develop transportation routes and schedules for students. Additionally, administrators may return to their buildings full time. When we are about two weeks away from returning, we will notify all school staff impacted that they are returning to school and the date for return. Additionally, we will share a schedule for the following week to allow staff time to prepare for students return. Administrators, teachers, leaders, and transportation staff will finalize student schedules and bus routes. One week prior to students return, our school-based staff will return to school. There will be opportunities to prepare classrooms. Administrators and transportation will work to provide families with student schedules and transportation routes. Additionally, school leaders will provide parents with communication with any school specific information regarding re-entry. Additionally, parents may receive messages from BCPS with reminders and reference to family and student support. As requested by the board at our last meeting, we want to provide an update on what families can anticipate the week students return. Students will return to small cohorts and be in classroom set up with mitigation strategies implemented. Additionally, they may experience changes to the physical environment. For an example, markers on the floors to ensure social distancing and signage in the hallways to remind students and staff of protocols. Social emotion learning will be prioritized during the first week back. Teachers and school support staff will work collaboratively to take time to check in with students and allow them to get to know each other face to face. Students may have modified schedules due to mitigation strategies. Parents should anticipate that their child or student may have a different schedule. All efforts will be made to attempt to keep students with their current teachers. And teachers and administrators will orient or reorient students to the building, new structures and new system. This may be the first time for a student in a new building. Additionally, there may be new procedures for school routines that allow mitigation. Staff will take time to teach and orient students to these new structures. The, the Department of Information Technology has stood up FOCUS, our current scheduling software, as BCPS Student Information System. Staff prioritized enrollment, attendance, report cards, transcripts, and discipline as required module. FOCUS was an easy transition as it already contained a large amount of student data, including addresses and phone numbers of students. Both digital and the VIP phone systems are functional in BCPS sites. We are working to achieve Wi-Fi in schools by February 1st. As restoration continues, safety and security have been prioritized, including facility access, facility control, and facility surveillance. Next slide, please. And finally, we are planning a staff information session held by Baltimore County Health Services and our own health services to share information with staff and respond to questions about the vaccines. This meeting will be available to staff on Thursday, January 21st, 2021. And at this time, we will pause for questions. Thank you very much, um, both Dr. Branch and Dr. Williams. And uh, we have a couple questions. So at first, it uh, looks like is board member um, Ms. Matt. 
Um, this, I have a, two questions for Dr. Williams and one for Dr. Branch. Dr. Branch, uh, I am very blessed to have received the vaccine due to work that I do for a local hospital. And that process involves scheduling, validating who I was, administering the vaccine, tracking any side effects, and scheduling my second appointment. When you ask for a plan from BCPS, what, would you expect that that plan would include how BCPS plans to do each one of those things? So the answer to that is yes. However, we already have the system already set up. So oh, great. Um, okay. So <laughs> once BCPS provides the staff, we will teach them exactly what to do. And, it's, and all the infrastructure is there. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much for answering that question. And and Dr. Williams, um, th thank you very much for providing information. You said um, one week prior to returning to school, school-based staff, or one week prior, school-based staff will return to school. Since teachers have never set up their classrooms, when will when will they be given time to set up their classrooms during that week? And who will be teaching students while they're doing that? So thank you, Ms. Mack. That is the purpose of giving staff members a week to make that transition, and we will work out a schedule uh, in terms of still abiding by some sense of virtual learning, but also providing time for teachers to set up classrooms. It's kind of like what we were planning to do with our four public separate day schools and building a schedule to not only provide some instruction during the day, but also providing the time for staff to return and set up classrooms. So hence why we said a week. Okay, we thank you. And, a week. and then my last question is, um, will families with children attending different levels like elementary and middle school, are, are there gonna be any efforts to cohort those children together on hybrid days? Um, because, uh, parents have said to me it would be difficult if their elementary school students are scheduled to attend Monday, Tuesday, and their middle school kids are virtual those days and vice versa, where the elementary would be virtual on Thursday, Friday. Are we looking at that from the family perspective to help parents with daycare and any other scheduling? If I may, Dr. Williams, I can answer that question. Yes, Ms. Mack, we are, and that has been taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McComas, very much. That's the end of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Next, we have Dr. Hager. Um, hi, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. So the board members were asked to submit questions ahead of time to Dr. Branch, and Many of us did, and so those questions are not going to be answered, um, but instead we are being instructed to reach out to folks at Hopkins. Is that, what, is that what's happening? Are you asking that of Dr. Branch or Dr. Williams? Either, yeah. Okay, yes, I guess Dr. Williams would so, answer that he, the BCPS staff facilitated our request. So, so Dr. Hager, um, the questions that we received, we shared them with Dr. Branch, if they weren't answered tonight, we'll be happy to respond. Um, this is again uh, an agenda item. I don't know if I can have Dr. Branch to attend a, an upcoming meeting, but absolutely we'll, we'll look at those questions if they weren't answered tonight. I can't speak on the Johns Hopkins question. I don't know if Dr. Branch wants to share information. Well, I do know that there were some questions that were asked that I did see. There's a lot of questions that <clears throat> I think that the local health department is not the appropriate um, um, place to actually be asking those questions. And I know that the county exec kind of is establishing <clears throat> um, a relationship with John Hopkins specifically for the school system so that those questions can be answered. Okay. Um all right, thank you. And and I want to um, revisit that slide uh, Dr. Williams had, which would have been the, the ready, ready, set, go slide <laughs> that we talked about before um, with the one week. I don't know if you can bring it back up again, but um, but so it, do we have to get to the 5% and 15 per 100,000 to even initiate this, this plan that then will take three weeks? Or can we begin the plan when we start to see 
the numbers trending in the in the right direction. So um, I don't see the slide, um, Dr. Hager, but that was the whole point of getting the work done so we can be to a point where um, once the metrics uh, look favorable that we're able to um, proceed. Again, it's going to be the notification every week. We meet with Dr. Branch and his team and we study the metrics. Um, so uh, a lot of this is around the communication and making sure we communicate that at some point, as Dr. Branch shared the latest metrics, at some point we should be able, hopefully we, we should be able to start communicating that in three weeks, four weeks, um, the metrics is set. we're starting to see a decrease or decline and it's falling aligned with, uh, as Dr. Branch shared, with what MSDE and the State Health Department is saying that we should look at with a hybrid model. So we don't need to be at that point to initiate the, the, the second block on this flowchart. We can be trending in that direction. We could be trending in that direction. OK, OK, that's good to know. Um, and then I have a question about youth sports. I don't know if we want to take other questions and, and circle back to that, or do you think now would be good to talk about that? Go ahead. You have a question about athletics? About athletics, yes. Um, so we have been, uh, someone said that the original plan was to, to restart high school athletics on February 13th, which would have aligned with the um, the, the plan that was in place. Could you update us on kind of where you guys are with your planning for that? Sure, I'm gonna ask Dr. McComas um, to respond or at least to give us an update as of tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Hi, Dr. Hager, and good evening, um, other members of the board. Um, so where we are uh, right now, as you indicate, our fall uh, competitive season it was scheduled uh, to begin February 13th. You know, at this time, we are providing, uh, continuing to provide virtual athletics um, and we'll continue to monitor. We have, you know, anchored our decisions every step of the way in the health and safety metrics. So at this point, we have not um, eliminate the possibility that the um, fall season could begin as scheduled. OK, so um, with respect to that, I actually do have a motion that I would like to make. Um, and uh, you know, I'd love to hear feedback from my other board members. Um, the motion would be to resume fall sports. So I move to resume fall sports for high school on Saturday, February 13th regardless of the status of reopening high school buildings and then to proceed in accordance with the Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association roadmap for the return of interscholastic athletes. Second, 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 Causey. Second, Causey. Okay, it's been, um, a motion has been made and seconded. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak to this, to Dr. Hager's motion? Uh, it looks like specific Can, can, I, speak, can I speak to it? Uh, yes. Ms. Sorry. Uh, I, there are a few reasons sorry, why. Yes. I, I, Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, Hager. There, there are a few reasons why I felt that this was an important motion to make. Um, I have been watching the COVID metrics very closely, and we have started moving in the right direction as a county. And so, kind of like what Dr. Uh, Williams was saying, I think we're when we start trending in that direction, we need to start moving into into more of an action phase. Um, and fall sports are so unique in that tryouts typically start in the weeks before school starts. So it's not unheard of for these athletes to require their own transportation to tryouts or practices before the building is open for the rest of the students. So it, it's, it's a, a unique situation where we could potentially have fall sports start with tryouts and practices before the buildings are open. And in general, those sports that we're talking about do have less direct contact than winter sports and are often played outside with, with some exceptions that usually have small numbers and can be done safely. And then lastly, the this MPSSAA plan um, had fall sports starting on February 13th in their competition seasons option two plan. So th this motion would coincide with that original plan and get us back on track to be able to provide these opportunities for our kids. OK, thank you. It looks like there's a question and we're asking questions specifically to Dr. Hager's motion um, and it looks like it's Ms. Jose. Thank you, Dr. Hager, when you say fall sports, do you actually mean spring sports because it's after winter sports starting in February? The plan because was for fall sports. 
I may be able to help clarify, Ms. Jose. Um, our okay. original plan set forward uh, to begin a competitive season was out of its normal sequence. We, um, our proposal had originally been to start the competitive season with the traditional winter teams, and then um, the fall, the traditional fall teams, which include um, sports, uh, for example, football. I'm trying to scroll down my list here really quickly. Soccer, all those sports that cross country, those things that traditionally run in the fall uh, would run during the, the second season. And then we would round out the school year uh, with the normal traditional spring sports. I hope I was able to provide some clarity for you. OK, thank you for that, Ms. Jose. Next we have Ms. Rowe on the motion. So my question is, um, if we're beginning these sports and they're happening outside, um, and sometimes we're using school property and county property, has the county allowed rec departments to resume sports? And is our shared use agreement going to, um, like, is this gonna be problematic with our shared use agreement? Can, can we actually, are we aligned with what the county's already doing, I guess, if we do this? Dr. Williams? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. That's a good question. That would be one of many questions we will have to get answered um, based on what uh, we have with the shared agreement and based on uh, our coaches. I also would have to say we would do, we will have to look at transportation. I just can't assume every student can get to practice. Um, so the logistics uh, would have to be well thought of. And we would have to work with our partners to get up, get those answers. So if we approve this motion, does that present problems if any of those answers come up the wrong way? Or is it just a matter of logistics one way or the other? I believe it will be logistics and there may be some some conflicts. I won't say problems, maybe some conflicts. Again, um, I think that's something we would have to explore and we have to notify the board whether or not um, we can address all the logistics. Again, I just want to reference um, transportation and coaches availability. Uh, we would have to work through those issues. Madam Chair, I move to table this motion until the next meeting and take it up then after the count, uh, superintendent has had a chance to check with the county and answers the questions we have to see that this is something that can even be facilitated. Madam Chair, may I speak to the motion to table? This is Ms. N. Yes, Ms. N. Well, um, is there a second first? Well, yeah, if there has to be a second to table, then we can go from there. Is there a second to Ms. Rose's motion to table? Okay, hearing none, then um, we can continue with discussion. Mr. Alferman is next. Mr. Alferman, are you there? Yeah, I was on mute. I'm also on mute. <laughs> I would like to hear if, if, if he can give us Dr. Branch's uh, uh, views on this uh, on this on on this uh, on this uh, idea. Thank you. This is uh, Dr. Branch. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Did you repeat your question, Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, I would like to see if Doc. I would like if to see if Dr. Branch would give an opinion on 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 uh, on this. Excuse me. I'd like to see if Dr. Branch would give an opinion on this motion. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. So this is Dr. Branch. Someone's going to have to um, restate what the motion is. I'm very sorry. Uh, so if we could, Dr. Hager, could you restate your motion? And then after she restates it, Dr. Branch, um, board member Offerman would like your opinion on that motion. So um, Dr. Hager, if you could restate that, please. 
Sure. Um, I move to resume high school sports on Saturday, February 13th, regardless of the status of reopening high school buildings and to proceed in accordance with the MPSSAA roadmap for the return of interscholastic athletics. Okay, so as a health officer, I would have to say to you that the transmission rate in the communities is still extraordinarily high. And we've had um, private schools at this particular time who have attempted and tried to manage having sports um, in, in this um, milieu of high transmission rates. And what we've found is that there has been an increased amount of transmission um, throughout the teams and throughout the staff um, with COVID. So I would not say that I would agree with um, automatically starting um, sports on February 18th, not knowing what the community transmission rate is going to be at that particular time. Thank you for that, Dr. Branch. Okay, uh, next we have Mr. McMillian. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me, Ms. Scott? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Hager ad addressed the issue about transportation, if I'm not mistaken. She mentioned that normally in fall sports, the you know they start in August and the student athletes provide their own transportation. Uh, that's one point. Secondly, having been an athletic director for 25 years, my concern about two seasons or the prior plan of three seasons and one abbreviated time frame is the lack of real conditioning and and the possibility of injury because of this slow or this sped up uh, conditioning program. Uh, I would just like to float the idea and for discussion, and I'm not saying I'll vote for Dr. Hager's motion if it comes to, you know, we actually vote, but I'd like to plant to float the idea of of one long serious spring season and not try to cram the winter and excuse me the fall and the spring together but one spring season where everybody plays their 12 or 14 game schedule whatever thank you thank you for that mr mcmillian uh next we have miss causey thank you madam chair um i just wanted to dovetail this um, motion with Dr. Williams uh, ready, set, go plan where one looks out on the horizon uh, three weeks and um, looking at the trends, anticipating whether we're headed in a good direction uh, or in a bad direction. And one can see even just from a couple days ago that the um, positivity rate has dropped from over 6% to under 6%. Um, and as Dr. Branch pointed out, the vaccinations are up and running and really uh, rolling out there. Um, I would like to say that it would be helpful to pass this motion and then we would have parents have time to plan, coaches have time to plan. They can start that conditioning that Rod's speaking to. And if in fact the numbers are not um, continuing to head in the right direction, then Dr. Williams could certainly uh, bring a recommendation back to the board um, that he would need to um, delay this for a week or two. Um, as to um, Mr. McMillian's point about the um, one long spring season, I would just say that some students don't participate in a spring sport. They participate in a fall sport and that this is also the MPSSAA plan that I believe 18 schools, high schools have um, committed to. Um, so the other question I have is, my understanding is uh, Mr. Michael Sai and um, Ms. Lynn Mitzel have developed a specific plan in the return to play work that they've done. Is that uh, available? Can that please be attached to board docs? Well, I can just share that that is still in draft form, Ms. Causey, um, and the, the plan ad addresses sort of specific um, uh, mitigation, you know, unique things to each sports, just to give you a sense of of what they're working on with that. Then I would ask that it be attached to the executive content of 
board docs or provided to the board um, in a weekly update so that we could review that work because I understand it's quite comprehensive and um, well done. All right, right on time. Thank you. And next we have Mr. Mahumza. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sorry. Excuse me, Madam Chair, could I just have my last point addressed by Dr. Williams? Um, I thought you were making a comment. Was that a question? The question was having the board receive the draft plan developed okay. by Mr. Michael Sai. And I thought that it was um, answered that it was not yet available to be received up and uploaded into board docs. Um, the first question was board docs and the second question when it's when she stated it was in draft form is in the executive content just for the board members or in an email just for the board members. OK, so Madam, your question is when can we have that? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Williams. Madam Chair, we will look at, um, I will work with Dr. McComas and we can look at providing that information to the board. Thank you. I, I think the, the original plan from MPSSAA is very comprehensive, but we will look at our plan as well and provide an update to the board in the near future. All right, Mr. Mahomza. Yes, I just wanted a clarification on the motion. Um, if passed, are, are they are they saying that conditioning will begin um, right away, so like tomorrow or the day after? And um, or is it saying that conditioning will begin February thirteenth? February thirteenth. Sorry. So. Um, February 13th would be the day that students would arrive to try out for the sports teams and things like that. Any any time there could be conditioning. I know there has been online conditioning. Uh, Dr. McComas could speak to that. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Hager. Um, you know, we have been running um, pretty much nonstop our virtual uh, program that involves students um, having um, weekly frequent contact with their coaches. They set workout goals for the week. They go through and talk about where they are. So uh, that's a form of conditioning. And as you said, uh, the in-person uh, that you're proposing the season uh, would begin February 13th. Thank you. OK, um, quick follow up. And could somebody, because um, I don't have that information right in front of me, uh, remind me when would the season like competitions and all that start? So the season would run uh, from March 13th to April 17th. I believe that's about six weeks. Uh, the uh, any competitions would be scheduled after a period of conditioning uh, that would be worked through uh, our athletic director. I don't have that uh, schedule in front of me. Um, however, uh, we would be looking at a course um, intercounty that competitions within the county that can be fit in within that time period. OK. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mahamza, I put that information in the chat as well. Hi. I appreciate that, Ms. Han. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. Next, we have Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn? Ah, uh, yes. I'm sorry. This mute button is not that fast. <laughs> um, I would uh, like to make a comment. Uh, Dr. Hager's uh, motion. I fully support the intent of this motion and I'll be voting for it. Um, our, our students have lost a lot and by at least handing this season back, um, we'll be providing some level, even though it's not normal, <laughs> but uh, uh, an ability for them to get out and play. So I fully support this. I think it's a great idea and I hope we can quickly process it and move forward. Thank you. Um, it looks like Ms. Rowe has another question and then Mr. McMillian. Ms. Rowe? Yes, I just wanted to um, first say that I'm not against the motion, but I don't feel like I can vote for it without more information. And starting with, if somebody could just list the fall sports for me, that would be extremely helpful because I, I don't even, I don't know what sports we're talking about. OK, Dr. Hager or um, I guess Dr. Williams, whomever could list the fall sports from Israel. Yes, I can run down them. Um, they include football, soccer, allied soccer, golf, field hockey, cross country, cheer, badminton, 
and volleyball. Thank you for that. So everything, so everything except badminton is an outdoor sport? Uh, badminton and... And volleyball. Yes, volleyball. Thank you. I knew there was a second one. I just couldn't find it quickly enough. And cheerleading too, Dr. McCombs. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. McMillian? As much as I don't like to read a text, somebody, an athletic director texted me and made the point that non-board coaches, which we have a lot of, <laughs> are not on the vaccine list and it takes six weeks total for first shot for immunity and high school teachers are last in line. So the issue of vaccinations for coaches was presented to me and that's what I, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, and then I would just like to um, have a question. Um, this is Makita Scott and um, uh, based on the motion that Dr. Hager presented, uh, I guess my question would be for Dr. Branch and Dr. Williams, um, there are certain areas of the county that have higher levels of COVID. I went to the Baltimore County COVID-19 dashboard and it's showing um, cases like in Dundalk that are over 3,000 um, and uh, other areas where it has like uh, it, like Pikesville, Gwinnow, Catonsville, where it's more than 2,000. And then there's other areas, Parkton or, or Whitehall, where it's it's the numbers are lower, like in 200 or, or 900. And so I guess I'm just wondering, given the numbers out there and the high rates in some areas, if we send everybody back for sports, um, <coughs> you know, what sort of, I guess, I, I don't know, I guess I would just like some more guidance or, or some more thoughts on that. That's what comes to mind for me. This is Dr. Branch. I can just comment that we have to remember that that, um, those, and that information goes by where people live, not where people work and play. So just because our, um, there's a, a higher concentration in a particular area does not mean that those people are remaining in, that, in and only that, that location. So um, if you have it in, um, there in one part of your, um, in your, of your jurisdiction, know that it's being transmitted throughout. Mm -hmm. that, makes sense. that does make sense. That is being transmitted throughout, of course, because people travel. I guess I was looking at where people live and children that live in those areas um, usually go to high schools or, or um, elementary or middle schools in those areas. So that was why those numbers were, were pertinent to me. And Madam Scott, I would just add, um, we will still have to look at the mitigation strategies. We would have to look at um, the number of spectators. And so that would be, again, a part of the athletics um, return or re-engagement plan. Um, so there's, there's, and families need to know and spectators need to know if this move forward, we still will have to follow the current mitigation strategies that we would have in place if we were um, doing hybrid learning. Okay. Ms. Ms. Scott? Yes. Who was? This is Ms. Pastu. <coughs> Excuse yes. me, Ms. Pastu. Um, I really appreciate um, the motion. I want children to be able to get back to some level of normalcy as possible. But after listening to Mr. McMillian and Dr. Branch uh, and thinking just about the logistics, just from this point, trying to get in about three weeks, uh, the transportation where they are going to have to ride from one place to another on a bus, the same bus, um, just all of the things that are involved in terms of moving them around, uh, coming out of one area that might be heavy in terms of the virus and to another back and forth. I'm just worried or very thoughtful about the time frame, time frame for the um, preparation for this. And I'm listening to Dr. McComas and Dr. Williams. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that needs to be said. I, I, I just wanted to express that. Thank you. Thank you um, for expressing that. So I think um, this has been um, discussed and expressed, and I think that we can bring it to a vote on um, uh, Dr. Hager's motion. Dr. Hager, 
Um, if you could restate your motion so that we could vote on that, please. Um, I, I, I wanted to make a, a comment. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. I put, I yes. put in the chat. Um, and it looked like Molly might have a, uh, a question as well. Um, I just wanted to clarify a few things. One is that this plan is already under development and hopefully should be very close to done at, since we're halfway through the school year. And so I, I, I hesitate to um, feel good about the fact that there isn't a plan in place already because I would have hoped that something would have been in place so that we could, you know, the concept of ready, set, go, you know, once we're there, we really want to, to get these kids back to some level of normalcy. Um, and as far as buses and transportation, if if things do start on February 13th, which is what this motion would, would suggest, and keep in mind, there, who knows what will happen over the next three weeks. We're trending in the right direction, so let's hope we go that way, but it could blow up. And, you know, we, we simply don't know. So this is a, very hopeful, certainly, but um, but the busing wouldn't start until March 5th. So now we're talking another, you know, month down the road. So I just think we need to keep in mind that because February 13th is, is the date that things start, it doesn't mean that we'll start busing kids. And we're all, you know, really hopeful that if we keep trending in the right direction, that we'll just be ready to go. And so I, I just hope that this motion will give hope to the kids and make sure that there's a plan in place that we can use so that they can get out there and um, engage in these sports that they've spent their lives working on. So that's it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, if you could, Dr. Hager, repeat your motion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm clear. Yeah. I move to resume fall sports on, or sorry, I move to resume high school fall sports on Saturday, February 13th, regardless of the status of reopening high school buildings and to proceed in accordance with the Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association roadmap for the return of interscholastic athletics. Thank you. And so now, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote on um, Dr. Hager's motion. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to ask a question of Dr. Branch. I believe next was Ms. Rowe. Yes. So um, I have a couple of questions about the delivery of the vaccine. And so uh, my first question is, the county has a registry form that you fill out and say what categories you fit into to be on a list to get a vaccine. Should school system employees fill out the county registration or will school staff be vaccinated by the school system? Um, it, it's actually both. They should do that because they may not be prioritized within what we're talking about now. So they still can actually get it through the county. So that if a person is not on the priority list and they were to um, fill out our registry, if they get a, an appointment, then they can still get their vaccination. Just because they're in the school system doesn't take them out of the county's possibility of getting a vaccine. Okay, so that may answer my next question is if people are school system employees but also fit into a risk category or something else that gives them priority then they should register the vaccine with the county or should they wait for the school system so basically register with the county and if the school system come whoever comes up with the vaccine first the person should take it you got it okay so the school system is essentially running like a separate health department? Or not, not by any means. At this I'm so confused. Time, so okay. is, is the school system administering vaccines like a subsidiary distribution site of the health department or are they operating like their own entity? No, it's, it's, it's a part of the health department, but let me explain. 
the health department does a mass clinic for everyone. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be of assistance to the school system so that we can prioritize them so we can kind of get the kids back into school. Okay, so... so Okay, so let me finish, let me explain. So what I'm at at this point now is if the school system can learn how to get do a, a mass vaccine the way I'm doing it, when there's more vaccines, then they can run a clinic specifically for school system employees. Okay, so that's the plan when there's more vaccines available. So right now, with a limited vaccine, is it only the county health department administering vaccines through the registration? Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. However, I have um, put some vaccine aside specifically for the school system, and that's what we're doing on Friday. Okay, so so the school system isn't being allotted from the governor a separate allotment from the county. The school system's allotment is coming out of the county's allotment. Yeah, uh, you got it. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out because. Um, so then, do people have a way if they get a vaccine through the school system to take themselves off the county registration, having already been vaccinated? The biggest one that they wouldn't um, apply for um, a, uh, an appointment if they already have it. I see. Being on the registry does not automatically get you a vaccine. Being on the registry allows your name to be there so I can forward you um, the possibility of getting a, uh, uh, an appointment when your tier 1A, 1B, or 1C comes up. I see. So people should pursue whatever, all avenues for getting a vaccine that they qualify for simultaneously. Right, and they can pursue a vaccine in other jurisdictions. You have employees who may live in another jurisdiction or work in Baltimore County. They can go to another jurisdiction and get a vaccine. They can go to another state and get a vaccine. Okay, I understand, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Next we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And being mindful of the time and mindful that Dr. Branch's time is limited, um, I have a motion I'd like to make at this time. And that is, I move that the board direct the superintendent to publish written responses to all board member questions regarding the reopening of schools to the BCPS website within 10 business days of submission beginning with questions submitted for the January 19th board meeting and moving forward until further notice and direction. Second. Who made the second? Ms. Causey. Thank you for that um, discussion. Um, looks like there's a question from Ms. Jose. May I speak to my motion, Madam Chair? Yes. Thank you. I understand we all have lots of questions and we could keep Dr. Williams and Dr. Branch here all night if they would allow it. So I'd like um, Dr. Williams assistance in facilitating getting these responses for board members. I also understand that the public has several of the same questions that board members are asking. So in order to facilitate efficient and effective communication for all stakeholders, um, this is the purpose of my motion to ensure that the information is collected and disseminated effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Yes, I agree with the premise of what Ms. Hen saying, but does everything have to be a motion? Can we just not ask Dr. Williams to facilitate this request and post everything? If and I could Ms. clarify, Williams Jose. can answer that. It sounds like, Ms. Jones, you're just uh, saying that we could just direct Dr. Williams to uh, post the questions and the answers on the website. Yes, and, and if he agrees, I mean, just in the interest of time, it doesn't have to be a motion. Okay. Dr. Williams, is that something that's feasible? Dr. Williams? I'm sorry. Um, so, I think it's feasible. 
I'm just thinking about the process and how we will do what, what's being asked. Okay, um, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, yes. I call yes. the question. I'm sorry, repeat that again, Ms. Hem. Thank you, I call the question. Okay, the question has been called. Is there a second? Second, Q. Second. Okay, okay, and so um, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote on the call to question, which is ending debate, and then we'll vote on the motion. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pasture? I have to abstain as well. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? I abstain. Okay, so the question has been called and um, Ms. Gover, per my vote, it, it passes. So now we'll vote on Ms. Hen's motion. I think we, uh, Madam Chair, the motion did not pass. It requires a two thirds majority. Oh, I thought the, we were voting on the question. The Calling the question requires two thirds. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then it did not get two thirds. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. So, um, the calling the question did not pass. Do is there more? Are there more questions on Miss Hen's motion or more debate? Madam Chair, this is Miss Causey. Um, yes, you have a question, Miss Causey. Yes, I, I think it is important to give uh, clear guidance um, to the superintendent and staff. I would only suggest that it be within seven days, not ten days. I'm not going to uh, make an amendment and re require another round of votes for that. Um, but we all know that this is a, a matter of some urgency. Um, as we need to plan and uh, people need to see that we are getting the information uh, that we need and that also our community understands that their concerns are being addressed and, and that community includes teachers and staff and um, and also our um, county officials and our state officials. Thank you for that, Ms. Um It looks like there's uh, an additional question from Ms. Jose. Yes, my question is for Dr. Williams. Is the 10 days a, a doable time frame to accomplish what's being asked? Um, I don't know, staff can answer that. So thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, I just want to remind the board we are not only looking at the reentry of students with, with the motion that was passed, looking at athletics, dealing with a ransomware recovery. And so, um, again, I'm processing the, the ask and the time frame, and then to lessen the number of days, I, I just think we have to be considerate that, yes, we want to make sure we respond um, to questions, um, but we will need some consideration about the time frame and the how. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, now are there, it looks like there's no additional, I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Dr. Williams? Yeah, can, can you ask Ms. Ms. Hen to restate that motion, please? Yes, please. Ms. Hen, could you please restate that motion? And then yes. we can vote. Mm -hmm. Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the board direct the superintendent to publish written responses to all board member questions regarding the reopening of schools to the BCPS website within 10 business days of submission beginning with questions submitted for the January 19th board meeting and moving forward until further notice and direction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. Okay, and can Ms. Gilbert, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. yes. Ms. Causey? 
Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Gott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe that was it for the questions of Dr. Branch um, from board members. Um, Ms. Scott, this yeah. is Mr. Kuhn. I, oh. I have some questions. <laughs> oh, I apologize, Mr. Kuhn. Please go ahead. Totally understandable. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Dr. Branch, thank you for your time. I appreciate you joining us. Um, the first question I have is around the mechanics of what you were talking about when you say that you expect the school system to run their own uh, clinic. I know we have our own nurses and I believe they're helping the county at this point in time. Um, but some of these um, vaccines are required uh, to be refrigerated at pretty extreme temperatures. And my question goes to, do you expect our employees to go to your site where these vaccines are available and handled so they can be administrated, administrated there? Or do you expect the school system to provide and handle these doses ourselves and, and therefore take custody of and manage that ourselves and the logistics associated with that? The health department will continue to manage the vaccine and it will be all done at the um, um, Timonium Fairgrounds. Okay, so you're just asking us to, to provide our, our um, medical staff to support that activity, correct? It's medical and non-medical staff. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and, and I wanted to follow up on a question. Um, you, you had said that you know, we have these metrics and they're dictated by the state. Um, so since vaccination is starting and the rollout is starting to occur, um, is it is it your position that the county will not take a position on whether or not vaccination of staff, uh, school staff, will change um, or or move or adjust the requirements uh, of, of the community metrics based on the amount of vaccination that the staff uh, that's available to staff and school support uh, folks? I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna need you to rephrase that question if you could. I'm, I didn't understand what you were asking me. So my question is, is the county going to um, help us determine whether or not the ability to vaccinate uh, staff, school staff, will affect the need for metrics? The issue of metrics and what those metrics will be is something that comes directly from the state. So the state school and um, MDH will be the ones who are make, making those metrics and they will be the ones who are making any changes in the metrics. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great. All right, thank you so much for that, Dr. Branch, and um, thank you so much for joining us and for giving us your expert opinion and everything. Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. I'd like a, to make a motion for um, the <clears throat> Dr. Williams to explore the use of Johns Hopkins as suggested by Dr. Branch and the county. Is there a second to Ms. Causey's motion? Hearing none, then. Second, uh, Kuhn. Oh, there is a second, okay. All right, and we can um, bring it to a vote. Um, the motion again, please repeat that, Ms. Causey. The board uh, directs the superintendent to evaluate the 
use of Johns Hopkins as suggested by Dr. Branch and the county. Um, and if I could get clarification on that, uh, Dr. Branch, was that your recommendation? That is the recommendation of the county um, executive. Um, and the, con the county was going to provide the resources in, in, a, to, to, in order for the, um, the school system to be able to use expertise at John Thompson Jeff. Okay, so that was a recommendation from the county executive. Yeah. Okay, great. And it looks like we have a clarifying question uh, as well as from Dr. Hager. Um, yes, so I use them for what? I guess is my question. Um, what, what, what expertise are, are we talking about? Excuse me, Madam Chair and Dr. Hager. <clears throat> I did want to speak to my motion. Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, uh, the reasoning of my motion is to uh, allow board members to ask clarifying questions uh, because there is the time limit of only two minutes per agenda item. Uh, I'm sure there's several just now having questions about this issue. So I thought, number one, it's important for the board to be able to, while Dr. Branch is graciously here this evening with us, to ask him those questions. Uh, but also the motion is to have uh, Dr. Williams evaluate it and, and then as he does with other things, <clears throat> bring the recommendation to the board. What does this mean for the school system? What does it mean as a benefit for our students or our staff in um, utilizing all resources available uh, to reopen schools in the safest, uh, most productive way? Okay, thank you for that. Um, it looks like we have a question from Ms. Jose. I think Dr. Hager asked that I wasn't sure what we're using John Hopkins for, and is that something Dr. Branch recommended? It looks like it was a county executive um, directive. And again, it's not clear to me what exactly are we using John Hopkins for? What metrics? Is it uh, some results? Is it, I'm not clear to the intention of this motion. This is Dr. Branch. Let me make it very clear that I um, too agree that it would be good if you guys use the expertise of John Hopkins. There are a lot of questions that the board seems to have regarding the research of the metrics, why the metrics, uh, <clears throat> youth sports, when should we go back, what does the vaccine mean? A lot of those questions need and could require an expert to be able to answer those questions for you in a very timely manner. What I was explaining to you before is the fact that as a health officer, I am inundated with a lot of practical pandemic stuff that I'm doing at this particular time. I cannot comment on many of the things and answer all the questions that you guys seem to have, but a panel or some experts from Johns Hopkins would be able to do that for you without any problem at all. And this is a resource that the um, county exec is willing to provide to the school system. Did you have another question, Ms. Shields? I believe you still have time. Yes, so is Ms. Causey's motion to ask all of the questions the board has to John Hopkins and how do we facilitate that? And is it just all the questions the board members have sent? I'm not sure. I, I still am not clear to what we're asking them to do. Just answer our questions or provide metrics. I'll be happy to restate my motion. The motion is to direct the superintendent to evaluate utilizing Johns Hopkins as offered by the county executive. Okay, uh, Dr. Hager, it looks like you had a follow-up question. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess when I submitted my questions to Dr. Branch, I wanted his perspective as our health commissioner. Um, I, I am a scientist and I am at a, a fine institution across the town from Johns Hopkins. Um, and there are lots of experts there as well. And I often, I, my colleagues who are infectious disease epidemiologists and uh, infectious disease docs um, when asking them for advice around COVID. But I think 
the benefit of having, you know, being part of a governmental organization is, is understanding what the health department's kind of perspective and viewpoint is. So I actually don't love the idea of, of sending our questions to um, scientists who, you know, or I, I, I don't, I just don't love that idea. I think the, the point is to find out the perspective of the health department who's providing guidance to the school system. Okay. Were there additional questions to Ms. Causey's motion? From Madam, Madam Scott Darrell Williams. Um, yes. I, I would just say to the board, um, based on what Dr. Branch said, um, he and I need to have further conversation, understanding the role that he serves and the role he has been serving with the support to the school system and then this request with Johns Hopkins, um, I think we have to explore more so we can better articulate for the board just the role of this additional support for the school system. Um, there seems to be several questions around this additional support. Um, and again, we're happy to explore that with Dr. Branch about next steps. So. I, I am at this point unable to articulate the the role, but I definitely feel that if our county executive wants to provide support, I would need to have some follow up conversations, not only with him, but also with Dr. Branch. Um, we want to clarify kind of just what the board members were just asking or started to ask about the role of Johns Hopkins. Again, we're following the state metrics we're following our co we're collaborating with dr branch and his team but i think it's worth um, some further discussion um, to understand what those next steps will be that i can then circle back to the board um, to relate to what miss causey put on the on the table about this motion before you vote i think i got to do some research first thank you for that dr williams and i would say that yeah. Um, as was said before, everything doesn't need to be a motion. That's something I think that we could just direct you to do and just work with you on. So I'm not sure uh, that motion is appropriate, um, but the motion is on the floor. Did anyone else have any questions? I do. Uh, Pat, this, this is Ms. Pasture. I do. Um, I heard what um, uh, Dr. Branch says said, and I do respect him. And the thing that I heard loud and clearly was that he does not have the time with all of the things that he is doing to try to get to each one of our questions. And we want our questions, we've just noted, we want our questions answered in um, a, a time period. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I'm, what it is we're asking them exactly to do. We don't have the details. There are a lot of levels and layers here. And I agree with what you just said, that we ought to first allow the superintendent to work through this new idea with Dr. Branch and with Hopkins and anyone else to see how they can best support us. Right now, we're just um, voting on something and we have no details. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, I would like Kelsey, to read please... my motion since there seems to be confusion. Yes, I was going to ask you, Ms. Causey, can you uh, please, because I've heard it three different ways, so if you could, um, and this is also why I like to get it uh, uh, emailed or written so that we can clearly see it, but could you please restate your motion? Yes. The board directs Dr. Williams to evaluate the program being suggested by the county executive to use Johns Hopkins. Okay, and let me just ask Dr. Williams, is that something that you're already doing or is that, or is this, would this be new? We have been working with Dr. Branch, um, so this would be new for us okay. to work with Johns Hopkins. I thought Ms. Cosby's motion was to evaluate how we would work with Johns Hopkins, not to work, but to evaluate how. So that means, I guess I was saying, like, it sort of, I thought Correct. you had been working with Dr. Branch, maybe looking and evaluating it. So that, that's my question. Yes. Um, I'm happy to evaluate the program, 
but I would have to work collaboratively with the health experts of the county. So if I'm evaluate, I don't know what the program is. Okay. That that's yes. so. This is this is Miss Causey. So clearly, Dr. Williams would reach out to the county executive and Dr. Branch to assist in evaluating the program that they're recommending. Okay, so that my recommendation would be, uh, and I would make a motion that we um, table this motion until Dr. Williams has had ample time, I guess, to work and to review this, and then it's something that we could um, look at again. Um, so that would be my motion to table uh, Ms. Pauzy's motion. Madam Chair, I would just suggest we take the vote right now, and then we don't have to do two votes, but. Well, the table supersedes the motion, so we would vote on tabling it and then um, and then for a later time and then um, we could review this uh, again. So is there a second to tabling the motion? Second. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote on tabling Ms. Causey's motion to a later time? Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Mahamza? Abstain. Ms. Rofferman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so it, by my count, it looks like the motion, uh, it looks like the tabling passes. Um, yes? Thank you, Madam Chair. Without making a formal motion, would it be appropriate to ask the superintendent to provide a summary of the Johns Hopkins plan in the next weekly update for the board? In other words, an executive summary of what it is the county executive is proposing? Yes, I agree. That would be fine. I, that, yeah, just working to get a um, summary update from the superintendent and just um, directing him to do that. Um, yes, if there is consensus. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And is there a question? Um, Anyone has Ms. Jose, you have a question? Just real quick question. I agree with Ms. Motions uh, with Ms. Hens. Look at me, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Hens directive. But my question is: Is there a fiscal impact to this? Is Hopkins free? Uh, will provide this guidance for free to BCPS? I can respond to Ms. Jose's question. I believe the county executive has um, generously offered to fund the cost of Johns Hopkins services. This is Dr. Branch, and that is correct. Thank you. Um, this is Dr. Branch again. It is now going on 8.30, and I'm going to have to excuse myself. So I want to just thank the um, board for having me on today. Thank you very much, Dr. Branch. Yes, thank, thank you, for Dr. Dewing. Yes, and thank God you, Dr. Bless. Branch, for joining us and for asking our questions and hanging in there with us. We appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Madam, Madam Scott, I'll be happy to provide an update to the board um, through the weekly update. Um, it will give us some time to explore uh, this, this support um, and work collaboratively with Dr. Branch um, since he too is aware of this request of support that we appreciate our county executive providing particularly as it, it relates to the reopening. And so um, my hope is to have an update as Ms. Hen requested by this weekly Friday, this Friday's weekly update. Um, but there's some more work that we have to do. We can work with our health services with Deb Somerville. We can work with Dr. Branch to, to understand what these next steps will be that includes this expert or or support from Johns Hopkins. OK. All right. Thank you very much for that. 
And um, moving on, the next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed fiscal year 2022 county capital budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit. Yes, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Superintendent Williams, Vice Chair, Board Members. Uh, tonight, uh, we are here seeking your approval for FY 2022 County Capital Budget. Uh, based on motions which were moved on uh, January 5th, uh, Mr. Dixon will provide an update uh, to your amendment. Uh, that was made on the 5th and will answer any additional questions that you may have uh, prior to voting. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. Uh, good evening, Chair Ms. Scott, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As Dr. Scriven indicated, uh, you made a motion to modify, make some changes, in the capital budget that we presented to you on January 5th. Specifically, the changes included uh, changing the Delaney High School replacement project and reinsert into priority 17 right after Lansdowne High School. And also the Towson High School project should be changed from renovation addition to a replacement school. Uh, the new plan that you have in front of you incorporates those changes. Um, I do want to state that the Towson High School project will go through the Maryland Historical Society review and uh, will receive extensive input from the community even after its change to replacement school. So based on these two changes uh, and there were questions received by the board that have been posted on board doc. Now we are requesting you to approve the plan so that we can move forward with the process. Oh, thank you for that, Mr. Dixit. I didn't know what, um, <laughs> if there was anything else. Um, so it looks like we have several board members who have questions, um, starting first with Mr. Rod McMillian. Great, thank you. I move to establish Dundalk High School as project line item number 17 and Towson High School as project line item number 18 and the FY 2022 County Capital Request. Point of order, Madam Chair, the motion is out of order as that specific issue was already decided in a previous motion and that was it was already stated in the motion to restore Delaney and Towson that they would keep the same priority order as what is in the current state request and this motion changes that order and the board approved to keep the priority order okay. of Delaney and Towson at the previous meeting. Can we get clarification? Okay, can I get clarification from, um, from legal counsel, um, uh, Ms. Howie or Mr. Brusades on the motion made by Mr. McMillian? Are Ms. Howie, are you on the call or Mr. Brusades? Yes, ma'am, I'm on the call. Yep. Thank you. Um, Mr. McMillian's um, motion was, it sounded like to uh, reorder, and um, Ms. Uh, Rowe was raising a point of order that his motion was out of order because the motion made in the um, previous meeting already set the order. So I was just seeing if we could get clarification on that. Mr. McMillian, how about this? Could you restate your motion, please? Sure. Thank you. I move to establish Dundalk High School as project line item number 17 and Towson High School as project line item number 18 and the FY 2022 County Capital Request. Okay. And if I may, Ms. Scott? Yes. Would the you motion like to is a lit. Yeah, the motion at the last meeting. The motion at the last meeting was to um, restore Delaney and Towson to the project line item numbers and spec project specifications as the FY22 state request. And if you look at the state request, um, no, no, we, I, I think we get the we, we get yeah, the gist of it. So what, what I'm asking McMillan, now, no, no, we. we 
point of order. We get the gist of that. So now what we're asking okay. from legal is, is Mr. McMillian's motion um, appropriate? Because you raised a point of order and right. said that um, he could not make that and motion. So now, okay, thank you, Ms. Well. The grounds but again, they, uh, they don't need, we don't need, they can, excuse me, Ms. Rowe, issue. point of order, Ms. Rowe. Now we can hear from legal counsel the uh, position, the official position on that. Ms. Hallie, well, if you can go ahead, or Mr. Mercedes, feel free to jump in, please. We need legal um, uh, advice on this. Yes, the, the board can, I understand, as I understand the Roberts rules, the board can uh, reconsider its action relative to a prior decision, um, and that would be by a majority vote. Okay, so then Mr. McMillian's motion is, I guess I just need to say it yesterday, is his motion out of order, or can we vote on his motion that was moved and seconded? We can. You can vote on his motion. Okay, that's the bottom line. That's the question. Okay. So Mr. McMillian has made his motion. It has been seconded. Is there a discussion or Mr. McMillian, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, very briefly. Thank you. I'm doing this because of the overcrowding, overcrowding issues with both high schools. The Canada design, which the Baltimore County government paid $1.2 million, projects that in 2026, Dundalk High School will have 656 over capacity. And they also state in that, that plan, Towson High School will be 480 over the plan. So I'm concerned about overcrowding in both of these situations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And for clarification, because there has been quite a bit of conversation, um, who seconded Mr. McMillian's motion? Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones, thank you for that. Okay. And next um, we I have Ms. Hen, Ms. Hen and then, um, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Senator. I have an, another motion. I do not want to speak to Mr. McMillian's motion. Oh, OK. I thought you had a question about his motion. OK, we OK, we can um, uh, we'll, we'll come to you then. Um, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I would just like to make a comment. I support, although I support um, Mr. McMillian's addition of Dundalk. I, I don't think that it should displace Delaney. I think it should be in addition to Delaney. Um, and and we can talk about where it goes on the list, uh, but I, I don't believe at this point in time that it's an appro is appropriate to make this change. It should be an addition since we already voted last meeting to add Delaney back on the list and to modify Towson High School from uh, purely a renovation to a new school. And I would also suggest that at the last meeting, uh, Mr. Dixit said that um, construction of Lansdowne won't even start until 2026 and won't be completed until 2030 based on current projections. So I understand that our, our um, um, we're, we're seeing significant overcrowding. I would love for that to be sped up, uh, but uh, based on the information provided, we're, we're basically talking about schools that are going to be out beyond the starting date of 2026. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, next, we have Ms. Jose. Thank you. I um, again echo what Ms. Mr. McMillian just said. We had a unbiased independent study done by the county at the cost of $1.2 million and they very clearly specified the priority list. We have an impending problem here. Dundalk High School will be overcrowded by 670 some seats. And to Mr. Dixit, how many relocatables would that be? Because even if the board was to approve this right now, we know a planning design construction takes eight to 10 years. So in 2026, we will need trailers or reloc relocatables as you call them. Uh, in Towson is again 400 seats that's going to be overcrowded in, in five years and it'll be a travesty for this board to overlook that problem and the so Mr. Dixit if you could answer that question. So 
if I got your question right, you want to know how many relocatables will be needed to seat 630 some students, uh, 657 students at Dundalk. Uh, if we take an average of 20 to 25 kids, we are talking about anywhere from 24 to 30 relocatables that are going to be needed to accommodate, accommodate those kids. Uh, those relocatables are enormous in number for a school. And uh, a lot of other options that we utilize for the other schools, like looking at redistricting and all that, that entire region is over capacity. So that option will not be there to redistribute those students. So in that sense, addition to Dundalk is a critical need as recommended by Canon Design. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Does Dundalk have any relocatables currently? And secondly, uh, if we make these arbitrary decisions by taking a study that was done independently unbiased by an architect, does that open us up to litigation? Because it seems like legally it's an arbitrary and capricious decision by the board to overlook an overcrowding problem happening in the southeast, which we can fix by prioritizing our projects, right? And Sparrows Point is also overcrowded and Towson is overcrowded. And to overlook that, also fiscally, how will that impact us? So I asked a lot of questions, so sorry. So, so you have asked several questions in there. Yes, Dundalk High School have some relocatables. Uh, the number, as I know, as I see here, is a few relocatables. Um, how much is going to cost? I think is the other one. Uh, it's it's just large amounts of money that's going to be needed. I did not in in all my life. I have not provided thirty relocatables to any school. No school in in the system to my recollection, had 30 relocatables. So each relocatable is a few hundred thousand dollars, and it doesn't provide the same type of environment as regular classrooms. So relocatables are more efficient when there is a temporary relief for a few classrooms. So that's the best answer I can give you right now. And what, my second question was about the, uh, you know, a capricious and arbitrary decision the board is making to overturn a uh, study done by, would that open the board at the county up for litigation? Uh, somebody from the Southeast su suing us because we decided to overlook and not look at the problem that's forming right in front of our eyes, uh, this problem, and you're not going to address it and look the other way. So does that open the board up for litigation and suing by the ACLU and NAACP? Point of order, the board does not seek legal advice in open session, nor is Mr. Dixit a lawyer. Right, and I was going to go down to that path at, at this time, Mr. Jones. We Thank would not you. be able to answer that question. Thank you for that. OK, so it looks like uh, next uh, we have a question from or, or a comment from Ms. Mack. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Scott. Um, I'd just like to say when I came to the board, it was um, at the tail end of the um, effort by Mr. Basu, the um, high school capacity study. And coincident with that, I attended some uh, county executive town hall meetings. And in those town hall meetings, the county executive was very clear about what his priorities were as far as replacement schools. Um, and there were, there were five schools, and I cannot remember the fifth one, but it was Lansdowne. Delaney, Towson, I want to say Sparrows Point, and I cannot remember the fifth one. I fully support um, Mr. McMillian adding Dundalk to this list because I think as a board, we need to ask for what our students need. But I do not believe that we should um, add a school at the expense of another school, especially since we spent a lot of money on the high school capacity study. And I don't think, and that was based on. Uh, facilities condition and overcrowding. So all of that to say, I support um, Mr. McMillian's motion to add any high school that we feel needs to be replaced, repaired, whatever, but I do not believe it should be done at the expense of another school. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, next, we have Mr. Mahomza. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, although I can't vote on this motion, uh, I, I support it uh, because uh, being a student in Dundalk, um, I've seen um, the need uh, to address the overcrowdedness. Um, and just speaking, uh, not as a board member right now, I just want to provide this anecdote. Um, ask any student at Dundalk uh, when they're changing a class. It's not the normal five minutes um, to get to your class. It's more than eight, 10 minutes because um, hallways, corridors are always packed. Um, sometimes students can't even move for more than six minutes. They're packed in like sardine cans. So and now the projections are saying it's getting worse and worse and we cannot overlook this and I think we need to address this and that's why I really support Mr. McMillan's motion and I hope the board can um, um, pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomes. Uh, next we have Dr. Hager. I just have a clarifying question for Mr. McMillan. Um, so on the list currently, um, Delaney is 17, Towson is 18, and Dundalk is 19. So will this motion make Dundalk 17, Towson 18, and then Delaney 19, or does it take Delaney off of the list altogether? I didn't mention Delaney. I, you know, I was interested in Dundalk and Towson. Delaney stays at 19. I don't care about that. I'm just interested in moving Dundalk and Towson up the list. Thank you. So, so it's essentially switching Dundalk and Delaney. Because Towson was 18, I believe, already. Yes. So yeah, so switching Delaney and Dundalk is the motion. Um, I, I, um, I'm I, learning about all this, so um, I just want to say that I, I did vote for adding D Delaney and Towson to the list because they weren't on the list last time. And my impression was that once we gave the list to the county, the county then ends up deciding and they don't have to follow our exact order of um, listing. And so I felt like we just are now going to give them the high schools that we know need help. Um, and so uh, Towson and Delaney are certainly two of those. Um, so I, I have mixed feelings about this because I know the order does matter and these are kids and these their buildings need, need help. And so, um, so yeah, I, I just wanted that clarification though. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have, looks like Ms. Uh, Rowe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Madam Chair. So, oh, excuse me. Sorry, Ms. Rowe. Uh, yes, who was that? Uh, Mr. Uh, Eric Brusetti is here. Uh, yes. Before we get too much further down the road with this motion, uh, there's one more element of a motion for reconsideration that needs to be addressed. Uh, and that is that the motion needs to be made by somebody who voted for the original motion that is being reconsidered. And I don't know whether Mr. McMillian was on the for side, the pro side of the original decision that was made, or whether somebody else who was on that Mr. side. Mr. McMillian was on the no side. I can answer for myself. Yes, I was on the no side. Okay. okay. So you're so saying the motion has to be made by someone who was who voted in um in favor of the previous motion at the last meeting. Correct. Wait, so where because, does, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, where does it say that so, so, I, so I can know? That's in Robert's Rules, section 37. Ms. Scott? Yes. This is Tracy. I do have um, the vote from the January 5th meeting. If you'd like me to read the favors. Yes, I would, please. Thank you. In favor was Ms. Rowe, Ms. Causey, Ms. Mack, Ms. Henn, Mr. Offerman, Mr. Kuhn, and Dr. Hager. And who abstained or who voted again, uh, no? Opposed was Mr. McMillian, Ms. Jost. Abstained was Ms. Pasture and Ms. Scott. Okay. And, um, oh, it looks like Mr. Offerman has a comment. Only that I would, uh, if, uh, if, it, if, it, if, 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 excuse me, if, if need be, I'd be happy to make the same motion. Thank you. Okay, is there a second? Right, second. I should have, oh, any second? 
Who provided the second? Second. Molly. Mercedes, Thank point you. of order. Does this okay. have to be someone? Oh my God, there she favor? goes again. That's what I was going to ask Mr. Mercedes. Does the second also have to be someone who voted in favor? Or can the second be um, any board member? I would need a few moments to look that up. Okay, while he's looking that up, um, Ms. Rowe, you can go ahead with your question. So, uh, Mr. Dixit, can you tell me, uh, it's my understanding that what we're talking about with moving Towson is Towson has overcrowded right now. And for Dundalk, we're looking at projected overcrowding. These are all projected overcrowding numbers. Also, the are you telling me the Towson is not overcrowded right now? Wait, let him, please let him finish. It is. Towson is overcrowded and so is Dundalk. Also, as point of clarification for Towson and Delaney, plan includes new school. For Dundalk, it is just an addition and not building a new school. So if that helps. How many years would adding the addition at Dundalk set back the new schools of Towson and Delaney? in the production lineup. So the Dundalk addition will be for about 24 classrooms. So how much time will Towson and Delaney new school projects lose by moving the renovation to that priority order? Now that's a difficult question to answer. It depends on the funding levels in the future. But what is obvious is that the addition will, will cost lot less. Uh, the addition of 24 classrooms may not be even quarter of the cost of a replacement school. So uh, it, it will delay the whole program, but it won't delay uh, by three, four years. It may delay by a year. That's the best by estimate. A year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And also, it looks like Ms. Calls, do you have a question? Ms. Calls, Chair. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to make a few points. The Canon design process is different than the Anne Arundel County Public Schools 10 year plan. The Anne Arundel County Public School 10-year plan, the board voted on the metrics that were going to be used, and they voted on the weight of the metrics before the calculations were done. So the movement of the weight of the metrics has affected the priority in recommendations. And I would suggest that moving the weight of the metrics without board approval was arbitrary and capricious. Second, I would like to point out that Towson High School has been over capacity for years, years and years, not the number four, for many, many years. They currently have, Mr. Dixit, is it 10 or 11 trailers? Uh, I, <clears throat> if you give me a minute, I can. They have 12 trailers or relocatables is what we call them. A total of 12 relocatables at Towson. Thank you. So that's 12 relocatables that are only there. And, and I would also. There, there are nine relocatables at Dundalk High School. Thank you. The next point I would make is as Mr. Um, Mills from Canon Design has confirmed, projections have not been evaluated for their accuracy at all. So to change the order based on projections solely is, um, in my mind, premature and building a foundation on, uh, on sand. So I think, as has been pointed out, the county executive also has the um, priorities that he's established and that it is his allocation of funding that will ultimate, ultimately uh, decide which projects uh, get moved forward. And I would just suggest to the county executive that he allocate to each of these projects 
some level of planning that can help move them all forward. We need to move forward as a school system for the entire county and not move backwards. And I'll reserve my time. Okay, um, next it looks like Ms. Mack you had a question and after that Mr. McGillian, Mr. McMillian. Yes, um, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Mr. Dixit, in the last meeting, and I think Ms. Um, Rowe or someone spoke to this, when I asked the question, um, you pointed out that the only school that is funded and will move forward right now is Lansdowne. And if my notes indicate that you said shovel in the ground spring of 2026. Potential, I know this is all potential, but potentially students walking through the door in the fall of 2030. Um, so based on that, when would an addition to Dundalk High School even begin? <clears throat> All of these numbers that we are talking about are projections based on current level of funding. So when you force me into coming up with a projection for Lansdown High School, what I shared with you is based on current level of funding, it will start in 26. Now I have to say that the design for that project will be ready a lot sooner than that. So should the funds be available, we'll be able to start within a year or so. So it's all relative funding. So if Dundalk High School is added to that, then it is right after 26 at the current level of funding that we'll be able to start. We'll have plenty of time to complete the design because it says it's an addition. So the design can be completed within next 24 months should the funding be available and the construction can start right after Lansdowne High School is awarded. Um, and what, what would you be doing with Delaney and Towson in the middle of that? It depends if the if the design funding is approved, we'll continue to design and be ready for construction when the construction funds are approved. So, so you could have three concurrent projects: Delaney, Towson, and Dundalk. If the funding is approved at the current level of funding, uh, the best estimate I can provide you that it'll be one high school at a time, or maybe one and a half. OK, thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, and uh, it looks like we have a follow up question for uh, from Mr. Rod McMillian. Just real quick, Mr. Pete, if I'm not mistaken, I've heard Baltimore County Public School staff say that their projection rates are 99 point something percent accurate. Is that true? That is true. OK, secondly, how many trailers does Delaney currently have? Delaney does not have a capacity issue. Let me check that. Let me go. Delaney does not have any relocatable. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. And I have a question. I would like to know um, uh, you said or was stated that more almost that what 657 students um, uh, I guess will be um, uh, or Dundalk will be seat deficient for 657 students. That equates to 24 to 34 trailers. Is there space on the property at that high school for that amount of trailers? That just seems like a, a large amount. Well, we like I indicated, we have never, never installed 30 relocatables in a school. It is going to be a challenge. It may impact parking there. Parking it could be put on parking lot. It could be maybe on the athletic fields, so we haven't investigated that, but it is something that should not be considered if, if we can help it and if we know in advance that that's what we are, we are going. So if there is no approval for Dundalk, I really don't have the answer as to where the seats are going to be for those students. OK, that, my question was just the, the, the layout of the high school and can it fit 30 almost 30 trailer i just i've never seen anything like that at a high school so that's why i was trying to visualize it and i was wanting to know that and then and then i was going to ask if that had if there was a precedence if that had been done but you said you've never seen it so that's interesting um and then i wanted to know um and i think miss causey had raised that I, I was saying you know 
uh, will Towson or Delaney have like 24 to 30 trailers as well? Or um, is this something specific just to Dundalk? Delaney does not have the kind of enrollment projection that will create a need for any large number of relocatables. Towson already have 12 relocatables and Towson will have a seat deficit of 480 seats by 2026. And they already have 12 relocatables. So that's another critical situation in terms of needs. So Dundalk and Towson, regardless of the condition of the building, uh, Canon Design gave them higher priority because of the capacity situation. Okay, okay, and that, and I was just, again, I was just think, thinking if this would start a precedence for multiple trailers at schools, more than 10 or 12, like 30, I guess, that was, that was my thing. Is this something that could start a precedence that could happen um, that, that this could be the norm because it sounds like this isn't short term, but this could be like long term. You are absolutely correct. And it's, when we talk about classrooms, we are not only talking about classroom addition, but also the common spaces, the cafeteria, the, the gymnasium, the auditorium. And it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenging situation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, looks like Mr. Kuhn, you had a question. Mr. Kuhn? Okay, don't hear from him. We can come back to Mr. Kuhn. Um, Ms. Causey, you said you have another question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dixit, could you please uh, provide the calculations that result in 99% number you stated earlier? Sure. We can give the numbers. Our annual accuracy for annual projections is more than 99%. across all schools in the county? As a system, as a system, the sy system uh, accuracy is 99% on annual projection. So just one year to the next year, and that includes some schools that are over the projections and some schools that are under the correction. That's projections, correct. correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And could you please uh, point out Delaney's mechanical, electrical and plumbing score relative to Dundalk's? Dundalk is a relatively new school. Dundalk High School does not have condition problem. It has a capacity problem. So it is in good condition, but it cannot accommodate 30 relocatables and not cause any problems. I'm sorry, did you provide the mechanical electrical plumbing Those four high schools that were included for air conditioning projects, they were the worst four high schools from the mechanical standpoint that did not have air conditioning and that had poor condition of mechanical equipment. That included Woodlawn, Patapsco, Lansdowne, and Delaney. Woodlawn and Patapsco have been renovated. Lansdowne is going to be replaced. It's under design. Delaney, we had added air conditioning uh, or we are in the process of adding air conditioning, so it will somewhat improve the mechanical score. But yes, it is still in poor condition. And there are eight schools now, according to new study, that are overall in poor condition. So I must separate that while Delaney was only mechanically in poor rated school, it has improved. But the overall poor rating, there are other schools that were rated poorer than delayed. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mr. Mills from Canon has stated that the projections are only shown to be accurate in the near term, that there has not been an analysis of the accuracy of projections of each high school. None of that has been provided to the board. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like we had another question from mm -hmm. Mr. Mahomza. Yes, Mr. Dixit. Uh, Dixit. Um, 
I recently took uh, uh, a trip to Dundalk and I saw that there was a new addition um, on I believe, the west side. Uh, so more greenery was taken over. So I guess if we're looking at uh, 30 more uh, uh, relocate relocatables, is it possible that they could take over uh, the new stadium that was recently built? Uh, we have not done any analysis for where the relocatables are going to be, mm -hmm. so I cannot provide you an honest answer. But just looking at it generally, 30 relocatables is a lot of space. It is yeah. four times more than what you already have there. Mm -hmm. So it definitely will impact either parking lot or fields, one of the two. Yeah, no, I've I've already seen it's already taken over a lot of our space. So I guess, and Dundalk is not a very big um, campus, although it, it's a big building. It's not very big because we have CCBC right next door. So I'm thinking, if is there a possibility? Then we have to like uh, maybe take over the CCBC field, which over there has like rec centers. Is that a possibility? And it, it, would the county even approve that? I cannot answer that question. You know, you know, I just cannot. All right. Thank you. OK, thank you. And last is Ms. Rowe. Oh, hi, Ms. Scott. Oh, oh I apologize. Um, Mr. Kuhn can go first if you'd like to. Oh, certainly, Mr. Kuhn. Well, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, Mr. Dixit, you um, have said multiple times that based on the current uh, state funding that we've been receiving, which my understanding is close to 40 to $50 million a year, uh, the timeline associated with the projects that will be addressed, right, as, as, as we move forward. So my question to you is, based on the Build to Learn legislation that did pass last year and unfortunately got caught up in a veto, um, and, and it will pass, I'm sure, uh, this year, my understanding is that that's going to um, bring about $400 million to the system in, in a, a much quicker timeline. So with that in mind, what, what is the impact on the projects we're looking at along with Lansdowne and the next project after that? That's a very good question. And uh, we still don't have all the answers to that, Mr. Kuhn. What we know a little bit that $400 million is going to be divided over a long period of time, anywhere from 8 to 12 years. So under the best speculation, that will add another 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year. It will also need county support in some proportion. How much is that going to be? I do not know at this point. I do not know if county has the a fiscal ability to support all the money, but I'm optimistic about it. So if all the optimism is there and we continue to be funded at another $40 million, then obviously it will have tremendous improvement over the time projections. Um, for example, Lansdowne High School, instead of starting in 26, we might be able to start earlier. And same about the other projects that are already ahead of Lansdowne. So there'll be considerable compression in the schedule, but that is also a speculation at this point. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sure with the, you know that legislation passing last year, that would have affected our capital plans going forward. So there should have already been some thought um, um, focused on that, and you know I'm hopeful that that works out uh, to our advantage. Um, my follow-on question, um, it, or I, I don't really have a question for you. I just wanted to make a comment that you know we all understand that Delaney is in deplorable shape. Um, and we understand that there's significant growth issues uh, and overcrowding at uh, Towson and Dundalk, uh, and especially in the Perry Hall area, there's just tremendous growth there. So we have needs in many, many places. And I would again um, suggest that we, we add to this list to encompass those areas. Uh, and I do wanna make sure, just so I'm clear, because when I heard, um, uh, uh, Mr. McMillian's motion originally, I thought that he was replacing Dundalk 
Uh, and I just want clarification. I'm sorry, replacing Delaney. I just want clarification that indeed he's just swapping spots and 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 moving Dundalk in front of Towson and and moving Delaney behind Towson. Is that is that accurate? That is my understanding. Okay. Thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Um, we have waiting patiently, Ms. Rowe. Yes, um, Mr. Dixit, can you explain to me if our projections are 99% accurate, how it is that we finished a brand spanking new Dundalk High School that is now overcrowded? And at the same time that we did that, we knew that Towson's problems were happening we knew that they were going to have a problem right now and that, that problem is going to be exacerbated and why it is that we attempted to solve a problem in the southeast with a new dundalk high school in 2013 finished it and now um, we're kicking towson down the road again okay so so you have several questions in there the 99 percent accuracy is for one year projection Construction funding is based on long range projections and the, the school that is built is based on long range projections, not on one year projection. So there are several things in mix are uh, mixing in there. Uh, even if we want to build a school for more than kids than what we have, but we can justify in seven year projections, will not be funded by the state. Hope that helps part of your qu question. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Offerman. I'd like to move the question. Okay, is there a second? second? Thank you. Okay, the question's been moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Gover, may we take a vote? I'm sorry, who seconded? We don't have a second. Lily Rowe. We have a second to move to call the question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. So now Rowe? we will vote on. Yes. Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Quite honestly, I'm confused with all these yeses in front of me. We're voting, we're voting. on my motion. No, no, no. no we're, we're, we're voting to call the question. To, excuse me, Ms. Rowe. We're voting to move yes. the question. Yes. To yes. Debate. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. So the, thank you for that. So the question has been moved and seconded. And um, Mr. Bersades, did you provide clarification um, on the appropriate second? If someone abstained, could they second the motion? Mr. McMillian, uh, or now actually uh, Mr. Offerman's original, um, Mr. Offerman's motion? Uh, yeah, anybody can be the second. Doesn't have to be in the four party. Okay, great. All right, so now um, if we could vote on on the motion and could we have the motion repeated because there's been quite a bit of debate. So could we have it repeated so we're all clear? I would ask uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. McMillan read it, please. Okay. Or Ms. Gover, did you have it? Yes. Okay, would you mind reading it? The motion was to move to establish Dundalk High School as project line item number 17 and Towson High School as project line item number 18 in the FY 2022 County Capital Request. Thank you. Okay, and if we could vote on the on the motion, please. Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. 
favor of six. Okay, so the motion passes. Thank you. Um, were there any other questions for Mr. Dixit or Mr. Scriven as it related to the um, fiscal year 2022 county capital budget? Um, Mrs. Yes. Scott? Yes. Uh, based on Mrs. Gover's reading of um, of the motion, it made no mention of moving Delaney to 19. So we just voted to replace Delaney without mo moving it to, to number 19. You've in essence removed Delaney from the list. I did not read the motion that way. Was that is that correct? Could we get a clarification on that? I thought we were reordering. Mr. McMillian. Madam Chair, may I make a motion to address this issue? Uh, yes, but also uh, we could just have the motion reread just so that we're clear. Certainly, let, let's reread the motion. Yes. Mr. McMillan, could you reread the motion as you presented it? Sure. I move to establish Dundalk High School as project line item number 17 and Towson High School as project line number 18 and the FY 2026 county capital request. So just to, to for clarification of what Mr. Coon said, if it's establishing uh, or reordering it, does that then, where does that move Delaney to? Question to me? No, no, I was asking, um, I guess, Mr. Dixit or um, Mr. Um, or Dr. Williams. Madam Chair, Dr. may I add clarification? Dr. Hager asked this question. Okay. And the response was that Delaney becomes 19. Okay, is that correct? Um, it, that sounds, that's what I thought I heard as well. That was um, not Ms. Gover's motion that she read, nor was the motion what Mr. McMillian read. I'm sorry, repeat that again, Ms. Hen. The motion that Ms. Gover read did not reflect the motion that Mr. McMillian read, nor did it reflect the numbering of Delaney. Okay, so I would ask Dr. Williams, I would ask staff or Mr. Dixon, with Mr. McMillian's motion, does that mean then that Delaney, or excuse me, with Mr. Offerman's motion now, does that move Delaney to 19 or where does that put Delaney in the order? That would be my understanding unless board has a different take on it. Because my understanding is that it would move Delaney to 19. That's correct. Madam Chair, I would like okay. to make a motion to move Delaney High School to priority order number 19 on the fiscal year 2022 County Capital Budget Request. Second, Second row. Okay. All right, and um, Ms. Causey, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think there's been enough discussion this evening. Um, I am, um, as I have said, I think all projects need to be moved forward and I would call on the County Executive to provide planning funding uh, for as many projects as they can allocate in order to get them shovel ready for hopefully when the economic crisis is passed and the money uh, does come back to our school construction program. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Causey. And it looks like uh, Mr. Offerman, you had a comment? Only that, only that I assume that the Lenny was going to be the 19th one when I uh, when I made the motion. That's all. Thank you. Yes, as as did I. But this is clarifying it so that it's um, so then basically you're, with your motion, it's, it would have Dundalk as 17, Towson as 18 and Delaney as 19. Correct? Yes. Yes. OK. OK, I move the question. All right. Um, second. The qu question has been moved and seconded. Um, so now let's vote on moving the question and then we'll vote on the motion. Um, Ms. Gober, can we do a roll call vote, please? I'm sorry, who seconded? Lily Rowe. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? 
Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahumza? Sorry. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Now we will uh, vote on the motion. And uh, Ms. Causey, could you please repeat the motion again? Thank you, Madam Chair. The motion is to add Delaney to priority order number 19 on the fiscal year 2022 county capital budget request by priority order. Thank you. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had also had a question uh, from earlier. I would like staff to explain footnotes number six and seven. Is that Ms. Causey? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Williams, or, or rather D Mr. Dixon or staff could respond to Ms. Causey's question. So I'll read it to you and then see what is not clear in there. Funds for designing one high school, which is Lansdowne, and perform preliminary planning on other two schools, Towson and Delaney, had been authorized by the county. The remaining unused funds in conjunction with new funding will be used to design an addition to Dundalk High School and preliminary design plans for replacement school at Towson High School as recommended by the multi multi year improvement plan. So what part is not clear? Let me know and I can update this modified. So footnote number six does not mention the um, plan. What you said at the end is not on item number six. So the, the question is, are does that footnote mean that the 15 million set aside for lands down, the 500,000 for Towson and the 500,000 for Delaney are now going to go into a pot that is going to be divided amongst Lansdowne, Towson and Dundalk? No, it does not mean that. 15 million for Lansdowne are approved and are solely for Lansdowne. The 500, a uh, thousand that was assigned for preliminary design, which is just exploring the work that needs to be done. Some of it has already been spent. And uh, board has in one of the questions we have provided response in writing as to what has been spent. Uh, the other part that is not spent will be used to support other projects that board has approved. The limitation here is the $200 million of bond amount that county has approved, the bonding limit. So that's limitation. Other than that, county will decide how to re redistribute those funds as needed for other projects. Thank you for that explanation. Can you also read and explain footnote number seven? Further development of phase one and phase two recommendations by my IPAS is necessary to determine the remaining improvements needed in the central, northeast, and southeast area. 
So as part of this plan, if you go down on the list, there are funds that have been approved um, uh, for further work in the northeast central area and southeast area, which is what Canon Design has recommended to explore as to which high school should be renovated or replaced and look for the sites if that's what is needed. And that work is yet to be done, but there is some amount of money that is approved here by the county based on Canon Design's recommendation that was shared with you in our earlier meetings. Thank you. Um, were there any additional questions? Uh, follow up? Oh, yes, Ms. Mack. Yes, um, Mr. Dixit, I see footnote number seven, and I guess my question is, why are we looking at um, the development of phase one and two based on the My iPass recommendations when the board never approved the My iPass recommendations? My iPass was shared, the phase one was shared with the board. It is funded by county, so it's going to be approved by county because they are the ones who provide us with the funding. Uh, the, the deal, as I understand, is that the recommendations will be shared with the board and phase one has been shared and phase two will be shared once it is completed. And the schedule for completion has already been shared with the board. So on a going forward basis, every recommendation would be based on my iPass. Is that what you're saying? That's the goal and we'll we'll share those recommendations or Canon Design will share those recommendations with the board. So none of the facility and overcrowding scores used by the high school capacity studies will be um, used at all. Is that correct? Uh, when you talk about a high school capacity study, that's the where we looked at oh, the, we gave scores for overcrowding and school facilities. Will that information be used at all or was that money that was just wasted? I want to make sure I understand your question right because there has been a high school capacity study that was done before this study. So if your question relates to the prior study that was done by Sage Policy Group? Yes. Now that the results of that study were shared with Canon Design, but the recommendation under my iPass are based on Canon Design's study and not on Sage Policy study. So I've been on the board for two years. We've spent millions of dollars and we've totally disregarded the information that we got from the first study. Is I think what I, I'm hearing you say? I didn't say that. A lot of that information has been shared with Canon Design. They have included as part of their review, Sage Policy Study, GWWO Study, and any other information we had on facilities. So their recommendations are based on all of the previous study plus their own analysis. And a lot of their recommendations are not a whole lot different, at least in the high school area that were you know, they're not different than what say policy had. Well, thank you, Mr. Dixit, for your time and your answers. Thank you. Madam Thanks. Chair, I would like to make a motion that. OK, excuse the me. Board um, again, the, could you, uh, could staff, anyone who makes a motion, could you identify yes, yourself staff, for a question? Because I can't tell who is speaking. Apologies, Madam Chair. This is Miss Causey. I would like to make a motion to remove Footnote number seven. And that additional deliberation is needed by the board. To consider the remaining projects. Period. When you say remaining second? projects, do you mean the phase two of this study? OK, Ms. Causey, are you still there? Yes. OK, so um, Ms. Causey made a motion. Is there a second to this motion? Second, bro. OK. Madam, could 
if you repeat if, your motion, please. That's what I was about to ask, Ms. Cause, if you could repeat your motion because I believe Mr. Dix had asked a clarifying question. Certainly, I'm typing it into the chat. Board directs that footnote number seven is removed and further deliberation. Um, could you? Okay. Sorry for well, determining are you additional it into chat. Yes. And what page is footnote number seven on so we can share that with everyone? It's only page one of the fiscal year 2022 county capital budget request by priority order dated January 19th, 2021. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Um, it looks like Dr. Hager has a question. Um, I just wanted clarification again. So th the footnote seven is only under the two high schools that need an assessment study. So they're just asking the project is an assessment study, not building anything, correct? Footnote seven is indicating that Phase one and phase two recommendations from my iPads and board hasn't even seen phase two recommendation is necessary to determine the remaining improvements needed to all of the schools, including elementary and middle schools. So it is just saying that board will look at all of the study, the phase two also, and then future of the program based on that. Footnote seven is only under Northeast slash Central Area High and Southeast Area High for assessment studies. Yeah. So, OK, all right, just clarifying. Thank you. OK, Ms. Rowe, you have a question? Yes, um, I just wanted to speak to my second in that I think the footnote should be removed because it confuses the community as to whether or not we are bound in some way to recommendations that haven't even been decided yet. And I would not like for the community to be confused thinking that somehow um, we're making a commitment to my IPAS that we have not made, nor could we make having not seen the recommendations. And as there has been a lot of discussion in the community, believing because of these footnotes that we made some sort of a commitment, I think that we should get rid of the footnote because getting rid of the footnote does not change the reality of any decision made. It just eliminates the confusion in the community. Ms. Mack, you have a question? Um, yes. Um, I know that Lansdowne obviously is in the Southwest, but we have other school conditions in the Southwest and I am concerned. I uh, Number one, I agree with Ms. Rowe. I think we should just remove it, but I am concerned that it specifically states Central, Northeast, and Southeast, and says nothing about the Southwest. So uh, if we remove it, it's a non-issue. If we don't, I need to understand why we're not looking at the needs of all schools in all areas. Agree. Ms. Scott, can I move the question, please? Yes. Second on moving the question. Second. Yes, so the question has been moved and seconded. Um, Ms. Gover, if we could vote on the moving of the question. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Posse? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Ms. Hem? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Sorry. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank the you. The question has been moved and passed. Now we can um, vote on the motion. And um, Ms. Causey, could you again restate your motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. Board directs that footnote number seven is removed and that further deliberation by the board is needed to identify additional projects. 
All right, and Ms. Gover, if we could vote on that. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Abstain. Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pasture? Abstain. Mr. Kim? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Six in favor? Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Gover. Okay. Ms. Scott, can I just ask the clarification that, that that passes, right, with six? I, yes, I believe it does. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, because the student member isn't voting. That's correct. correct. I just wanted to correct. just clarify. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so um, may I have a motion to approve the budget, um, the proposed fiscal year 2022 county capital budget as amended? So moved, offer. Is there a second? Second row. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call discussion? Or excuse me, a roll call vote. <laughs> Ms. Rowe? To make a brief comment. This is Ms. Causey. I'm sorry, we're voting. We're voting. Well, uh, you made a motion yeah, and we didn't ask for discussion. We're voting. It's voting. We, I, we had discussion and we've discussed it and discussed it, so now we're voting. So, um, we're going around doing the roll call vote. So if we could continue with that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Again. Ms. Quasi? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Ms. Ham? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Bichun? Yes. Dr. Hanger? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the next item on the agenda is the update on hate symbols, symbols ban. And for that, I call on Ms. Howie. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. At your July 14th, 2020 meeting, you asked staff to investigate the potential board prohibition of hateful speech and symbols, which include but are not limited to Confederate flags, swastikas, and any other symbols that the superintendent determines to be inappropriate in schools. This evening, I'll present briefly talking about three topics. First, the legal concepts involving speech. Second, the current authority of the board and the superintendent. And finally, staff recommendations. First, legal concepts. A ban on hate symbols impacts and involves the First Amendment rights of students. The case on point is Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District, decided in 1969 by the United States Supreme Court. In that case, students Mary Beth Tinker and her brother wore black armbands to protest the Vietnam War and were suspended for so doing. The Supreme Court held that while students had First Amendment rights and specifically stated that they did not shed their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate, that schools still had the right to suppress student speech if that speech substantially interfered with the work of the school or impinged upon the rights of other students. As well, speech, student speech, cannot materially or substantially disrupt the educational environment. Messages by their very nature that are designed to intimidate or to express hatred could be considered disruptive 
and in my opinion, can be suppressed. That brings me to the current authority of the board. As discussed directly with the Policy Review Committee at their June meeting, I indicated at that time that the board and the superintendent, based upon the current law, have the right to suppress hate speech and hate symbols. However, there's no current data on how many students have violated or have used hate speech or hate symbols in our schools. We do not have a metric to measure that. Finally, what options and what the staff recommends. As indicated in my report to the board in the executive summary, we believe that the board should amend policy 0100, your equity policy, specifically to include a ban in policy 0100. And the language that is being recommended is as follows. The board prohibits the use of language and or the display of images and symbols that promote hate, racial or ethnic violence or intimidation, and can be reasonably expected to cause a substantial disruption to school activities. Such images or symbols would include the Confederate flag, swastikas, and nooses. If there's an explicit ban in policy 0100, the superintendent at that point would be able to amend the dress code, which is superintendent's rule 5600, and then punishment for any infractions would be imposed in the 2021-2022 school year. I'm available to answer any questions that the board might have. Thank you for that, Ms. Howie. Um, are there questions for board members? Uh, are there questions from board members? Ms. Scott, this is Molly. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Jose. Ms. Howie, you you say that this should be we should um, update our policy. Now, does that need to include uh, different hate symbols, or you just that's a comprehensive list? You know, there, there's several other ACLU identifies a lot of hate symbols. Does that take into account because as we go through new hate symbols come into play and no child in BCPS should feel uncomfortable uh, for portrayal of say, you know, uh, a symbol that could be seen as oppressive, um, the new white power that's also very oppressive to people of color. So does that include those symbols and is this going to go to the PRC for updating the policy? Uh, so to answer your first question about whether or not the list is exhaustive, unfortunately it's not and I don't believe it can be. Uh, the language included in the uh, recommendation is includes but is not limited to. And as to your second question, I apologize. The uh, it would go to the policy review committee. That's per your normal process unless the board wishes a different process for this particular change. Thank you for that. Thank and, you, Ms. Howie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jones. And next, it looks like we have Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I wanted to uh, thank the board for addressing this issue and for requesting uh, the superintendent and the Office of Law to evaluate this very important issue for our students. Uh, we know that in normal times there are um, bullying and, and other um, oppressive things that happen to our students and especially as uh, we hope to rejoin in person soon that we know that there's a lot of um, trauma and, and uh, social and emotional um, challenges that we'll need to really address with our students. I think it's important work and I think it's very timely, so I appreciate that. Um, I would just ask for clarification that um, this addition to the policy uh, does not exclude images utilized for educational purposes. There's um, obviously history books and so forth that have these images, but they are utilized uh, solely for educational purposes. So if I could just ask for clarification on that point. 
So given that these are symbols that are being displayed by or worn by students, wouldn't include uh, lessons. So okay. if they're symbols we're using, that would not be what's being banned. It's the students or it could be, unfortunately, uh, some of our employees who are displaying or wearing some of these symbols. Thank you for that clarification. Surely. Yes, Mr. Mahumsa. Yeah, I have very uh, few comments. I just wanted to say um, thank you uh, to staff and uh, Dr. Williams for working on this important policy. I look forward um, for the discussions that's going to take place in PRC, but I just wanted to thank you all for this important work and um, to our partners and uh, all the legislation uh, legislators and uh, county leaders who supported uh, these efforts. I, we appreciate it. Um, now more than any time, uh, the board needs to take a firm stand to make it clear that uh, we don't stand by uh, such hateful symbols and speech that insult and dehumanize um, our very diverse student population. It is imperative to uh, make a rapid change, and I look forward um, uh, to that policy change. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, are there any additional questions? OK, seeing that. Yes, who is speaking? Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe, yes, Ms. Rowe. Um, I would just like to make a motion to move the recommendations to the PC PRC committee. Second, Causey. OK, um, uh, if I could ask uh, just for clarification, um, Ms. Howie, didn't you say that it was already the recommendations were already going to the PRC committee? That's up to the board, ma'am. If the oh. board wishes them to go to PRC, that's the board's prerogative. Or if the board wishes to deal with the changes directly. But given that it's your normal practice, that PRC deal with changes to policy, makes sense to follow normal practice. Okay, thank you for that then. Okay, so the motion has been moved and seconded. Um, uh, follow up, Ms. Jose, was there a follow up question? Yes, this policy that's just for school system. Does this include board members and uh, staff and you know other or just school system? So policy 0100 and that's one of the reasons that we wanted it in your basic commitments series. Uh, in the 4000 series, it would have just applied to um, employees in the 5000 or 6000. It just would have been students. That's why it's in the uh, the basic commitments. So it, it is exactly that a basic commitment of the Board of Education that certain symbols should be prohibited in the schools. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For um, any additional questions for um, Ms. Rose motion? OK, hearing none then. Um, Ms. Gopher, may we take a roll call vote? And Ms. Uh, oh, excuse me, Ms. Rowe, could you repeat your motion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll just check it on you because I know motion? it was close to your bed, Can somebody mute their phone, please? I'm sorry, please? there's a lot of talking. I didn't hear yeah. what Scott asked me to do. Yeah, excuse me. Um, Scott, can you mute your phone, please? Everybody could please mute, thank you. I recognize it is getting late. Um, but what I had asked is if Ms. Rowe could please repeat her motion. I move that the board forward uh, staff recommendations on hate speech to the PRC committee. OK, and then it was seconded by, I believe, Ms. Ms. Causey. OK. Yes. OK, great. Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote on that, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hanker? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries.
And thank you very much for that, Ms. Howie and, and staff and everyone who worked on that. OK, the next item on the agenda is the update on board committees. Links and documents related to the committee meetings held last week can be found on this agenda page. Future committee agendas and documents will now be found on board docs under the committee name. This week's curriculum and equity meeting agendas have been posted. So first we have audit committee and we have Ms. Rowe. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, first I would like to uh, welcome Mr. McMillian as uh, starting February 1st, he will be the new chair of audit committee. And we had our audit committee meeting and the big item of business that we did at that committee meeting was we approved the committee charter and the Office of Internal Audit Charter and moved those out to the full board for consideration. So um, you'll be seeing those on some future agenda. Um, and we continue to hear updates um, from the Office of Internal Audit and that they are recovering from the ransomware attack. So um, I hope that they will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Next, we have building and contracts and we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. The building and contracts committee met on January 5th. We approved four contract modifications. Um, the committee did not meet earlier today. Um, and as of the next meeting, we also will have new leadership um, welcoming Ms. Joes as committee chair, also welcoming Mr. Offerman and Mr. Kuhn. And I'd like to thank Ms. Rowe and Ms. Mack for their service to the committee. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, next, we have the curriculum committee, Ms. Pastor. Good evening, thank you. Uh, the curriculum committee will meet this Thursday at 2.30. Uh, we have some interesting items on the agenda, so you might want to tune in. But I want to thank and congratulate Mr. John Billingsley from the Social Studies Office. If you haven't done so, please uh, tune in to Homefront, World Cultures in Context uh, tomorrow at 3 o'clock. The guest artist will be John Tavius Willis. And I was able to preview what he will do. Very, very interesting. Um, and it's a great series. Thank you, Mr. Billings and your office. Again, I want to congratulate, I believe it's still Mr. Collins at um, Towson uh, for the wonderful work he's doing with his students this week. I received uh, a presentation from Patrice, uh, who is now going to be working with Mr. Nieves uh, on mental health for our students. She has created uh, some wonderful suggestions and a plan for our young people, particularly during this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Mrs. Pastor. And the next one is the Equity Committee, of which I am the chair. And the Equity Committee um, has not met yet. We will meet uh, this coming Thursday, um, which is the, looks like it is the 21st, and where we will uh, look at various issues, but we have not um, yet had our meeting. So I do not have a report to give at this time. So thank you. Next we have is the Legislative and Government Relations Committee, and for that we call Ms. Pastor. All right, and I want to share this time with um, Ms. Hen, who was the board representative for the Adequate Public Facilities or Ordinance uh, Task Force. They did their final report. Uh, Ms. Hen reported on it, uh, and she is going to do um, a motion to the board. Uh, I do want to point out that it did recognize a number of things that the Legislative and Government Relations Committee started talking about well before Councilman Marks, and we want to thank him for spearheading the task force, but before he even put together that task force, we started talking about looking at with the county council 
the our overcrowded schools. We have so many schools, as we all know, that are 115 percent above capacity, which is the current rate, and so many that are under it, but still very much overcrowded. So the task force took a look at those things and the final report gives a lot of considerations to things that we have discussed in that committee and on the board. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hen so that we as a board can consider it. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Pastier. Um, I am excited to share with you, as Ms. Pastier said, that the um, Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance Task Force did issue their final recommendations to the County Council on December 31st, and those recommendations were made available to the board. You should have all received a copy. They are also available on the County Council website on the APFO webpage for the public to access. And I am now seeking your approval um, of the following motion. I move that the board fully support the recommendations of the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance Task Force as Second recommended Rossi. in Government Relations Committee. Oh, sorry, second row. Okay, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Hen, would you mind repeating it again? I think the last part got cut off. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the board fully support the recommendations of the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance Task Force as recommended by the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. Okay, great. And I believe it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. Okay, yeah. any discussion? Okay, and um, Ms. Gilbert, may we take a roll call vote on Ms. Penn's motion? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Joe? I didn't listen to abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is eight? Favor is eight? Okay. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott, could somebody mute? Could you ask everybody to mute their mi microphone, yeah, please? Yeah, hearing a, a background noise. Um, Sounds like a television. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was feedback or a television, but I'm not hearing it now. So hopefully whoever that was muted it. Ms. Scott, before you move on, I'd like to thank uh, you and Ms. Rowe for your service to that committee. And I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Mahumza as the uh, new vice chair of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. And next is uh, policy review committee. And for that, I call Ms. Causey. Good evening and thank you. So for policy review committee, uh, we had last met December 14th, um, excuse me, our December 20, our December 14th, 2020 meeting was canceled due to the ransom attack. I had requested from uh, staff if we could schedule a meeting in January in order to make that work up. Uh, additionally, as we have voted here tonight and at the last two meetings, there are policies that are being sent back to policy review for processing. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get that uh, meeting in. If not, the next meeting is February 22nd. Um, I also want to uh, appreciate um, Ms. Gover for analyzing our board docs and utilizing them uh, for additional purposes um, with our committees. Um, it's going to be uh, really helpful for community, but also board members and staff to go to one location that's going to have all the documents 
uh, the meeting links uh, and the video archives and so forth all in one place. Um, also wanted to point out that the board docs um, was not impacted by the ransomware attack. So utilizing this uh, platform will provide additional uh, data redundancy for the school system. So it's a great move and I appreciate the efforts uh, that are going into it. Uh, also, the law office was able to get all of the policies back online and they will be on the board website, but they are also in board docs and there's a special tab uh, for policy. So I invite our community members to start to explore board docs uh, for all of our committee meetings. Um, it's been my pleasure to serve on the policy review committee, um, gosh, since 2016. And um, I look forward to remaining and I uh, look forward to continuing that work. I also want to um, acknowledge Vice Chair Julie Hen, and I appreciate her collaboration in the process that uh, we had utilized uh, for the last two years, across two years, because there's a lot of things that change in terms of um, understanding board members' um, desires and skills, and uh, and then uh, evaluating that. And um, I think in almost well, in almost all cases, we were able to uh, create teams. Uh, that the board members um, wanted to be on. So we, I really appreciate her efforts in that. Uh, she went above and beyond in the role as vice chair. And so um, that is my report. And thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Causey. And thank you for all of your um, hard work and leadership on the policy and, and review um, committee. Um, okay, so that's... Um, completes our committee updates. Uh, next, uh, the next item on the agenda is, the, well, the next item on the agenda is for um, information items, which include the revised superintendent rules, 1290 and 6,000. And after that, now we will, the next item is on the agenda is for consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. So at this time, if there's anyone who has a request, um, we can go around um, the dais and um, uh, you can make any requests that you have for future board meetings. And we can just go in order um, around. So we can start with Ms. Rowe. Yes, I would like to see on a future agenda reconsideration of policy 8221, duties and responsibilities, board officers chair and vice chair duties. I would like to see the board reconsider whether or not board members should be prohibited from serving on committees. Okay, and next we have Ms. Causey. Thank you. I would uh, request again that the uh, ransom attack recovery be on every um, open, uh, closed and open agenda item um, until uh, the recovery is complete. And I would also reiterate the request to have um, analysis done on projections um, over a longer term, say five years, and, I, and I'm not going to spell it all out because Ms. Mack has spelled it out uh, multiple times. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next is Ms. Mack. Um, yes, per request made from a stakeholder with whom I wholeheartedly agree, I am requesting that at least one board meeting a month include a presentation of actual academic achievement data, the factors that impact academic achievement and discussion of efforts by BCPS to achieve better academic outcomes for all students, especially our marginalized student groups. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, next, we have Mr. McMillian. We haven't talked about it in several meetings, but I'd like to reopen the discussion about board members attending a live board meeting if they so desire. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. McMillian. Next, we have Ms. Jose. I have nothing. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Uh, next, it looks like we have uh, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I would like to be provided a more comprehensive update on special education and how we are meeting the needs of our most vulnerable learners in a virtual environment. We've been provided limited information and I believe board members still have um, significant questions 
and would like to hear how in this continued virtual environment we are meeting um, those learners needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Penn. Next we have Mr. Mahomsa. I look forward uh, in the coming months on an update on uh, graduations and um, end of the year senior activities. I think um, with everything going on this year, we're for learning, um, trying to get our students back in schools. I, I really hope we don't forget our seniors last year. I know families were very disappointed and um, I just hope uh, with this group and hopefully if possible, we can make up something for last year's group in terms of celebrating them in person. Uh, I'll be appreciated. I'll be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Uh, next, we have Mr. Offerman. Nothing at this time. OK, um, Ms. Pastor. Nothing, thank you. OK, uh, Mr. Kuhn. I would um, like to see in the very near future the plan, a presentation or um, and, and data to be provided to support um, plan to measure academic progress across the system, especially for our youngest learners that need to read by third grade. Very concerned about those students and we need to really focus on them to measure them currently to make sure we know the impact of the pandemic. Thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I just uh, briefly wanted to mention publicly that um, I've spoken with Ms. Scott about ha hosting a um, conversation around the community eligibility provision in addition to um, the pandemic EBT distribution and how uh, the different programs work uh, together. And we could talk also about potentially um, school meal distribution. And so having a conversation around all of those topics at an upcoming equity committee meeting, because this is something that's uh, certainly affecting families a lot right now. And so um, more to come, but I think that 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 conversation will likely happen during an equity committee meeting. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I would just um, use this time again to thank all of um, all of you for your service and everything that you're doing, your commitment, your time. Thanks staff and, and everyone um, who's here and um, for all of the things that, that you brought up and um, look forward to addressing and, and, and looking at all of those. So thank you for that. Um, I would also like to, um, before we get to the final um, announcement, um, just remind everyone that our, our second um, budget work session um, will be scheduled for Tuesday, January 26th. And um, as was mentioned earlier, and the last item on the agenda is announcements and the board's next meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, February 9th. 2021 at 6 30 p.m. So um, with that, I thank you all for joining us tonight and the meeting is now adjourned.